transcript. Good evening. This open meeting of the Arlington School Committee is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th due to the current state of emergency in order to mitigate the transmission of the virus. The governor's order suspends, <coughs> excuse me, the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order which you can find posted with the agenda materials for this meeting allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded. The public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation and such, unless such participation is required by law, this meeting will feature public comment. For this meeting, the Arlington School Committee is convening by Zoom as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note, this meeting is being recorded. Some attendees are participating by video conference. I lost my spot. Please may, be aware that others may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All of the materials for this meeting, except for executive session materials are available on the Novus Agenda dashboard. We recommend members and the public follow along with the agenda. Unless I note otherwise, um, please note that, uh, please remember to mute your phone or computer. Please um, wait for the chair to yield the floor to you. After people have spoken, the chair will forward public comment. Uh, we will not be doing public comment. Finally, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by roll call vote. So let's do some roll call now. Um, Ms. Exton. Here. Mr. Cardin. Dr. Allison Ampey. Here. Mr. Thielman. Here. Mr. Schlickman. Mr. Hainer. Here. I am also here. We'll come back for Mr. Cardin and Mr. Schlickman. Uh, Dr. Bodie. I'm here. Dr. McNeil. I don't see him yet. Um, Mr. Spiegel. Man, we just saw you guys. Uh, Ms. Elmer. Here. Um, Dr. Janger. Um, I see Mr. McCarthy, Ms. Keys. Here. Here. Um, I'm looking on the agenda, Mr. Mistler. Oh, Rob's stuck in the attendees. Okay, sorry. Here. All right, thank you. Um, and got all kinds of people on here. Let's see. Mr. Mason. Here. All right, and lots of other folks. All right, let's get Mr. Spiegel in. Mr. Spiegel, can you raise your hand so that, because there's a lot of people in this meeting. Okay, so um, we are going to start with the first item on the agenda, which is public comment. Um, public comment is limited to three minutes. Um, the school committee, as a matter of policy, does not respond directly to and often the um, sometimes what is brought up during public comment comes up during the meeting. Um, there are uh, five people signed up for public comment. If you are somebody who is signed up for public comment, can you go ahead and raise your hand? Because there are a lot of attendees um, and so that we can promote you. So the first person for public comment is Ms. Sarah Amico. Sarah, I'm going to promote you. And when, yeah. Okay. Ms. Amico, can you hear us? Len's in that group too. Hi everyone, can can you hear me? Go okay. ahead. Go ahead. You have three minutes. Thank you. Um, my name is Sarah. I wanted to thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. Um, I just I feel it's important for everybody to hear everyone's perspective. Um, 
I want to start by saying the teachers have done an amazing job this year. They were given an impossible task and have done all they can do given the circumstances, um, as has all the faculty and staff. It's definitely not easy to deal with what's going on and I want to make sure they know how much their hard work and dedication is appreciated. So thank you very much. Um, I do have questions, I guess, um, about next steps. Um, what, if anything, is going to be done to get our children into school um, on a full-time basis <clears throat> at the beginning of the school year? <clears throat> excuse me, we can all understand and appreciate the approach that was taken. There were lots of unknowns as to what the virus would look like once these kids returned to school and the hybrid program was a great option. Um, the kids have now <clears throat> been in school for over five months and to the credit of all faculty and staff without any transmissions within the school. <clears throat> but where do we go from here? Um, the CDC recently released information stating kids should be back in school. Other towns nearby are proactively <clears throat> moving forward to a four to five day school week if they haven't already done so. Um, <clears throat> two in-person days a week, I don't feel is sufficient, especially for children at the elementary level. It's a disservice to our kids to not be back in school on a full-time basis. By the time the kids are in school for two days or a day, a holiday comes up, a snow day hits. Um, and on top of it, the days that they are in school is very minimal <clears throat> with interaction from the teachers. Aside from Wednesday, half days, children are left on their own, unable to ask questions when issues arise. These kids are suffering. They're suffering socially, emotionally, physically, um, at a time when there's so much uncertainty, at a time when kids need the stability of school more than ever, the doors have been closed on them. Um, parents are, <clears throat> aren't able to take their kids out of state during school vacation weeks to do something fun to help the state of kids' mental health without them having more school days missed when they return home, which would be okay if it was getting us to a point where the children would be in school full time, but that's not currently the case. So I'm curious um, with the statement that was made this week by Jesse and Governor Baker regarding the removal of hybrid programs and having the kids in full time come April has the perspective on how to proceed for the rest of the school year changed. Um, <clears throat> the union has had the teachers back and I feel like it's time for the school committee to have the backs, the kids' backs, and make their social and emotional well-being a priority. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Amico. Um, the next person is uh, Mr. Chris uh, Holler. Mr. Holler, when when we can hear you, you can go ahead and start. Great. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Um, good evening, uh, Dr. Bodie and the school committee members. Uh, my name is Chris Holler and I'm the father of a first grader, uh, Thompson in the hybrid program. Um, and I first want to thank the school committee uh, for all their hard work for pushing forward with this planning process to get our youngest learners back in school for full time starting this spring. Um, I, along with other uh, many other Arlington parents are anxiously awaiting to hear the plans that the superintendent's office is laying out by the March 11th deadline. And as we approach the milestone of one year since schools were first closed, the combination of decreasing COVID cases, expanded vaccine rollout, and evidence from a zero in-school transmission has fueled the momentum to increase in-person learning. Just this week, the Baker administration proposed a plan to have all elementary age children in school five days a week by April. And for the first time in a long time, I'm feeling really hopeful for my son. Uh, as we know, one of the major hurdles for return turning into full time is the distancing requirements of six foot desk spacing. And at Thompson, as well as other Arlington Elementary schools, I assume, it's physically impossible to have full classroom capacity unless that distancing is relaxed to a three foot minimum. Now this past December, a local group of leading scientists, physicians, and public health experts outlined a roadmap for safely reopening schools based on increased understanding of COVID-19 science and degree of risk in schools. In this document called Schools in the Path to Zero, they recommend three foot spacing 
for young learners when used in conjunction with other layering mitigation strategies, such as masking, hand washing, adequate airflow, contact tracing, and surveillance pool testing. Um, all of these things are established um, and are working really well by our students, uh, staff, and teachers. They're doing a brilliant job. Now, this reduction in the six foot spacing based on the scientific consensus was also endorsed just this past week by Brookline Public Schools, as well as a letter to Commissioner Riley from a group of 60 local physicians and scientists. So as long as our other established layering mitigation strategies remain in place and followed, relaxing the spacing requirements is the easiest and quickest path to getting kids back in school full time. And there's really no time to waste on this. So once again, I just wanna thank you all um, for all of your hard work in this planning process. We really appreciate it. And I'm happy to help in any way possible moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Holler. Uh, Ms. Christina Falcone. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yep. go ahead. Um, so my name is Christina Falcone and I have three children in the hybrid program at Stratton. Um, thank you for the chance to speak and also for taking the chance in the fall at having a hybrid program. Um, like most children in their classes, my children are thrilled to be in school with their friends and their amazing teachers on the two days that they're there. Um, I wanted to speak tonight to ask you to look deeply into having students come back to school five days a week. Our students are suffering, our teachers are effectively teaching two separate classes and are really overworked. Um, having students back five days is in the best interest for our students and our teachers. Um, going along with the recent recommendations from educa um, the Education Commissioner Riley, many towns are going back for more in-person learning. learning. Towns like Beverly and Cambridge, Duxbury and Needham, as well as lots of private and Catholic schools around town. Um, Arlington students and teachers deserve a chance to get back into the classroom five days. Um, back in the summer when conversations were happening about the fall reopening, no one knew if hybrid would work. And here we are proving it is working. Um, thanks to the de dedication of teachers and pool testing and teacher testings, our schools are safe and not a place where COVID is spreading. Now we need to take another move to in full in-person learning. I ask you to give full in-person learning a chance now because we don't want to be having these same conversations over the summer about what will happen in the fall. Let's figure this out now for our students and our wonderful teachers. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, Ms. Stephanie Trinko. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for providing me the opportunity to speak. Um, I truly appreciate all the hard work that the teachers, administration, and school committee have been doing during this difficult time. I'm the parent of a first grader and another son who will be entering kindergarten in the fall at Brackett Elementary. Sadly, um, we had to step away from Brackett this year and put our older son in a private program that was offering full-time in-person instruction. This was not our preference. However, during last spring, he was not able to appropriately participate and remote classrooms and have massive anxiety and sensory meltdowns. We tried everything to support him, but for the short, short term, we realized that remote classrooms were not a viable learning option for him. He's having a great year at his private school, but he misses recess with his neighborhood friends, Mrs. Perry's classroom rug at story time, and much more. With his specific circumstances, we just couldn't risk a year of his life in an untested model. And thankfully we had the resources and opportunity to put him in a private school. I asked to make a public comment tonight because all parents deserve to know what the plan is um, for a full return to school and when it will happen. We deserve to know this because it's changing our children's trajectory, wasting precious time when their brains are most plastic, causing families to make impossibly difficult decisions like leaving their jobs, moving away from their beloved community and so on. I'm worried because so far I haven't seen any movement from our district towards getting the kids back in person more. For example, when it became generally understood that COVID is not transmitted via surfaces, I thought that maybe we'd pivot um, and begin alternating Wednesdays as in-person days, maybe cohort A one week, then cohort B the next week, and so on. I've heard some other districts are doing this, among other things, to give kids more in-person learning time. As parents, we need to know with relative certainty when a full return will happen and what the plan is for getting there. So when will this plan be presented? Are we waiting for the teachers to be vaccinated um, and a full return is certain for the fall? Or is there something else that will need to happen? I respectfully ask for a deadline for the plan to be presented to parents so that each family can decide whether the plan will work or if they need to seek private placement, homeschool, or even maybe move to another town. 
Our town's children all deserve a consistent quality education complete with regular social and emotional growth opportunities and space to collaborate with and learn from their peers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the final person for public comment is Ms. Shauna Palauer. Yes, hi, can you, yes, yeah, sorry, sorry about the hand raising I got. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Dr. Bodie and members of the school committee, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Shauna Pellauer. I taught high school English for 11 years in Newton and am a parent to a Thompson fourth grader. Tonight, I'm asking the school committee to vote to support resolution number one, MCAS and high stakes testing which was approved by the Massachusetts Association of School Committees by a vote of 112 to nine last November. Somerville, Cambridge, Concord, and Winchester have already passed this resolution. Arlington educators should not be required to administer the MCAS on site during a pandemic. Here are my concerns for what happens if MCAS moves forward. Many families who are remote opt out because they do not want to be in school buildings. Well, that's going to invalidate district-wide results. So now we have individual schools having to allocate their already minimal staff time, space, and resources to ensuring that hybrid and remote students don't mix. And they have to do this for the multiple sessions of the multiple grade level tests and subjects that are given in a year. Children like my daughter, lose instructional time from their teacher on in-person days, of which she only gets 66 this academic year. I don't want her to lose any, and certainly not one for MCAS. And let's just say, for example, that all remote families choose to have their children take the test. All hybrid families do too. I used to teach sophomore English. I've had years of experience with my kids taking the MCAS. And as an experienced educator, I can tell you that the MCAS is not going to be useful this year. Even an abridged one with no high stakes consequences, they're not going to measure what you're looking for. The pandemic has changed everything and these old standards don't apply. I really feel that instead of relying on old ways of assessment, we can approach this topic with the same creativity, the same flexibility and the same generosity of spirit that our teachers have shown every day in these unprecedented times. There are 438 of them who respond to student needs daily, and they measure our students' growth in real time. They, not the test, can tell us more than MCAS ever will. Let's just ask them. So please support resolution number one and cancel MCAS this year. Thank you for your time. Thank you. All right, so that's, um, that's everybody for public comment. Thank you so much for coming. Um, so we turn to the first item on the agenda, which um, is the Arlington Education Association AEA contract vote. Um, so this evening we have um, before us a, um, a contract with our teachers union. Um, it is, uh, it will be public at the end of this meeting um, and uh, can be requested from our um, administrative assistant um, and will also be posted in Novus with the materials from this meeting. It is a, it is a one year contract uh, for the 2021-2022 school year. Um, and this was a process that we started back in November, December, um, and, uh, and, and have come come here here at the end of February ready to um, to vote on it. So um, I, you know, it's usually we do three year contracts with our teachers. Um, and uh, given the amount of uncertainty around, um, you know, frankly, financial and, and budgetary concerns moving beyond, you know, moving through and past uh, FY22, this was this was um, where we're at for right now. And this was what um, this is what we have, um, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm proud that this is where we've ended up at the, you know, after um, 
dur you know, during a really challenging year. So I'd like to thank um, Mr. Cardin and Mr. Hainer um, from the school committee who were um, our, um, on our negotiating team, um, Ms. Keyes and her colleagues from the AEA, uh, Dr. Bodie, Ms., uh, Dr. McNeil, Mr. Mason, Mr. Spiegel. Um, and um, I'm, so I'm, I'm glad to be here to do that. Um, Dr. Bodie, did you want to say anything about this? I realize it's your name next to it, not mine, actually. So did you want to share anything about this? You're talking. Sorry. Yeah, I was talking to you. Yeah, it, it has your name next to it. That's why. So it's fine. It's fine. Okay. Um, sorry, I have a phone in the background here. Um, I, I want to echo your thank you to everyone. It, it was a challenging year for everyone as we've also have heard our speakers beforehand uh, talk about. Um, we negotiated as we always have uh, with a lot of goodwill and trust. And I'm very pleased that uh, this contract can come before the school committee um, this evening. And Ms. Keyes is also here who is the president of the AEA. Thank you. Um, so do is there a motion to approve the uh, Arlington Education Association AEA contract? So move. Second. Um, any discussion? Actually, you guys are not all on my screen. Oh, maybe you are. Um, okay, seeing none, um, let's go ahead and vote. So Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. And I am also yes. Great, thank you very much. All right, the next item on the agenda is the Arlington uh, Rainbow Commission update. Um, Mr. Mistler? Hello, is it okay if I share my screen? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Okay, hello and welcome everybody. Um, this is a presentation from the Arlington LGBTQIA plus Rainbow Commission. Uh, my name is Keith March Missler. I am a commissioner, a Burlington teacher and an Arlington resident. And we have Molly Gillis. Would you wanna introduce yourself, Molly? Hi, my name is Molly Gillis. I'm a parent and resident here in Arlington. And Em, would you introduce yourself as well? Um, I'm Em Phillips. I'm a sophomore at AHS, and I'm the GSA's co-vice president. And I've been working with the Rainbow Commission in the with the middle school QSA and the high school GSA for the past few years. Thank you, Molly and Em. If you don't know what the Rainbow Commission is, it is a volunteer group of people um, appointed by the town to prom promote um, full inclusion of LGBTQIA plus individuals. Um, I was actually appointed by the school committee and last year, well, it was during the pandemic, last year you asked me to come back and to give you a little bit review of what we're doing, so that's why I'm here. Some of the things that we do in the Rainbow Commission is we have put up those happy pride banners that you see right under about us. Uh, we work with the library, the Council on Aging, and we're actually hoping to do more with the Arlington Public School System, and that's why we are here today. So let me just go to the next thing. Our key takeaways of this presentation is three things. We've got collaboration. We're really hoping that we can work together, like I just said. Um, the second thing is we're hoping that there could be a school liaison that you could possibly name tonight that we could work with to make it a little bit easier to have that collaboration happen. And then thirdly, we're hoping for LGBTQIA plus inclusivity in terms of hiring, curriculum review, and many other things that we'll talk about. Uh, so I first wanted to talk about with some teen stats about LGBTQIA plus students. This is from the 2017 Massachusetts Youth Risk Behavior Survey, which includes Arlington students. Uh, so it's sadly 22% of LGBTQ students attempted suicide because of their sexual orientation or gender identity compared to 4% of the straight peers. And 43% of LGBTQ plus students, oh, I just have to move you all, felt uh, actually hurt themselves compared to 14% of their straight peers and 28% of LGBTQ plus students experience bullying compared to 13% of the straight peers. So what we're saying here is that we really need to do something about it and we really need to um, promote inclusivity and have training within the school systems. 
And I'm going to pass this off to Molly. Hi, everybody. I just wanted to express gratitude to the school committee for making time and space to hear us this evening. It's a privilege to be seen and heard by this group, and we wanted to acknowledge that and say thank you. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I am a proud almost 10 year uh, resident of Arlington. My husband and I bought our first home here. We're raising our kids here. We love Arlington. And we've had an incredibly positive experience with Arlington Public Schools, largely through the lens of the Pierce School, um, where both of our kids have attended school and now our eldest uh, is moving to the Gibbs and now the Audison. I'm here today to talk to you about safe schools, which is one of my most favorite topics. Um, but in order to share with you how I got there, I'm gonna share a little bit about our family. And in particular, uh, my daughter, who's in the second grade at the Pierce, she's eight years old and she happens to be transgender. Um, our daughter socially transitioned in her second year of kindergarten at the Pierce. Um, she's a little on the young side, so she did kindergarten twice, which was actually a good thing because it enabled her to enter her second year of kindergarten in her correct gender. For those of you who might not be familiar with what it means to um, transition socially, it means different things for different people, but I can share what it meant for our daughter. And that is, she began to use she, her, hers pronouns. She grew her hair out long. Um, she started using the girls' bathroom at school, and um, she started wearing what she lovingly referred to at the time as girl clothes, the sparkly, the better. Um, again, her social transition was largely a positive experience for her and our family, and that was due to the partnership and communication with the peer school. The teachers and principals, then Karen Hartley, now Andrew Amati, have made a huge difference in her um, happiness and well-being and in our family. I will say, you know, as we moved through kindergarten, it was it was a little bit simpler as we got into the back half of first grade, things got a little more complicated. Um, there were some kids who remembered her pre transition, um, who questioned her gender, who questioned why she was using the girls bathroom. And, you know, to be you know blunt, it made her sad, it made us sad, and it was a difficult time. Um, teachers approached me right around that time and said, Look, you know, we're having conversations with kids. We can do that, but we're starting to have to call parents at home and we're not quite sure what to say. What do we say? And I said, you know what, I don't know, but I'll find out. So with Karen Hartley's support, um, I did some research. I reached out um, to the GEMS program at Children's Hospital, which is a world renowned program. And they highly recommended Jeff Barati and Safe Schools, um, which is a free program offered through DESE. Uh, Jeff and Safe Schools has been transformational for our family, for our community, and has made a huge impact at the Pierce. Before I hand it over to Keith to share a little bit about um, Safe Schools, which by the way, I know you're all familiar with, I know Safe Schools has been in and out of Arlington Public Schools um, over the years. I just wanna say a few more things. First, as a parent and resident, I'm deeply committed to supporting and being a good partner for my kids' principals, teachers in the district, each of you and your work to make our schools safe and successful for every child. I realize that is the collective goal and it doesn't rest on your shoulders alone. We all have a role to play. I also know that my daughter will leave the peer school feeling confident and safe in her identity, um, largely in part to, uh, due to the love and support of her family, her teachers and principals, her community and safe schools training, which her teachers have all uh, completed. She shouldn't be the exception though. And I'm not here today simply on her behalf. I'm here on behalf of the kids that will enter Arlington Public Schools after her and those who are in our schools now who lack the support, the confidence, and the advocates to be who they are and be proud of it. My daughter's transition was not perfect. We weren't aiming for perfect. We were aiming for a happy kid and working in partnership with our school to create an environment that was a little more informed, a little more open, a little more inclusive, building on the goodness that was already there at the peer school and using a growth mindset. I realize some of our schools have done the training, but teachers and staff are asking for support to talk about these topics beyond the 101, moving to skill building and action, uh, which is what we're moving into now at the peer school as well. One of our teachers, when asking for my support to identify training said to me, you know, your daughter is lucky. She has parents who know her, who see her, who love her and encourage her to be who she is parents who advocate for her on her behalf. What happens when I get a student who has parents who are not supportive? Molly, what do I do? This is why I sought out the training and this is why we're here today. I'm hopeful we can work together with the liaison and we're committed to doing the work and spending the time to build collaboration and partnership with each of you to keep the lines of communication open and to bring safe schools training to each school in the district on an annual basis 
focused on that skill building in action to keep the discussion and information alive and fresh for our teachers and staff across the district to help ensure all LGBTQ students feel safe, supported, and understood in Arlington public, public schools so that all of our teachers and staff members feel prepared and equipped to support these kids and their families. Thanks. And with that, I'll hand it over to Keith. Thank you, Molly, for sharing that story. As a teacher myself and Rainbow Commission member, I also attended the training. And I just wanted to tell you a bit about Safe Schools. It was founded by Jeff in Arlington back in 1993 and is a joint program of the Massachusetts Commission on LGBTQ Youth and DESE to address concerns of bullying and suicide risk that we talked about earlier that faces LGBTQ youth in Massachusetts public schools. And I just wanted to reiterate that it is a free training offered to all schools in Massachusetts. And Molly actually worked with Principal Andrew Amati to get the training on the books right before the holidays. And I just want to share a 20 second brief thing. Keith, we can't hear him. Yeah, we can't hear him. Oh, okay. Well, you know what? It's he just says it's great. So we'll move on. <laughs> Looking forward if, that to you. If, when you're done, if you can send the link to the slides again to, to Karen so at least the committee can see it. I'm sure that we would all like to watch that. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. And we also partnership with Arlington High School. And I and with that, I want to bring it over to M Phillips. M, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, um, hi, I'm very excited to be here presenting in front of you guys. Um, so I am a sophomore, I just got elected to be the co-vice president of the GSA, and I've been out since 2016. So it's been a rough beginning, but I feel very good. I have supportive parents and um, mostly supportive school environment. So this past summer, we, some of the people from the GSA worked on a pronoun video to um, educate some of the teachers and some of our peers on the correct usage of certain pronouns and how to use more inclusive language um, when in the classroom. And uh, I also shared my coming out story as part of this to just personalize it and make it really more impactful and really show that it's not like a faceless person. It's really a actual student that is struggling with these things. Um, this last year, we met with the health and history departments to talk about LGBTQ plus resources um, for their curriculum and classrooms. And so I myself am here presenting in front of you as a non-binary individual, and I feel very confident with my gender and sexuality not every student is, and it shouldn't be the GSA's responsibility to find resources to educate our teachers. It can turn into very uncomfortable situations and conversations when a student is educating a teacher and when a student is put on the spot to answer questions, and it's just not our responsibility, it's not our job in a school environment. Thank you so much, Em. And as a teacher myself and 10-year advisor to the GSA in Burlington, I can also attest to that. Okay, And I can share that video with you later. Um, so I just wanted to conclude our presentation with our three goals. And the first thing is that we hope that all future hiring committees include active recruitment of BIPOC, LGBTQIA+, and differently abled people. Uh, safe schools trainings, you heard a lot about that from Molly. We want hope that you can bring in free safe schools training to all schools in Arlington every single year. And finally, we hope that there can be some kind of curriculum review um, in the 2021-2022 school year so we can come back and ask you what um, is being taught within the Arlington Public Schools. And finally, I'm really hoping that tonight we can get a liaison or you could think about giving us somebody to talk to so that we can continue this great partnership because this type of work, youth-centered advocacy, beginning with Teacher PD, is really, really important. So we're very excited to be here tonight and thank you all. If you need anything or if you have any questions or want resources, please reach out to the Rainbow Commission. You can reach out directly to Molly or myself or email this email on the slide. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thank you guys so much for coming. Um, if you don't mind, oh, perfect, I'm sharing your screen. Um, so I wanna open, um, open it up to questions or comments from the committee. Uh, I see Mr. Schlickman. Yeah, hi, thank you very much. And thank you for the presentation. 
Uh, I think this is a partnership uh, that the school committee and the school department needs to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, cherish and, and nurture going forward. Uh, when I worked as a principal, I had a trans third grader uh, in my building and the caring and compassion that I saw uh, led to a really happy school days for everybody in the class in that grade level. Uh, and that wouldn't have been the case 10, 15, 20 years ago, almost anywhere. It would have been much more of a struggle for the child. And, you know, it, 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 there's a certain emotional feel for this, that, it, that a child who could have had a rough, uh, rough run through school was supported uh, both by the policies of the district and the actions of the staff and the students within that setting and anything we can do to make that happen. This is a genuine issue that some kids face and the, the more compassionate we are uh, and ready to meet their needs, the better. So thank you for coming before us. Thank you very much. Dr. Allison Ampey and then Mr. Hainer. Thank you. Thank you, um, all of you, for coming and talking to us. It's been this has been very interesting. Um, I was wondering if the statistics that you showed at the very start of your presentation were those from Arlington High School or from Massachusetts in general? It's the Massachusetts Youth Risk Behavior Survey, so it includes Arlington students. But it's but it's, it's not just yeah, it's not yes. just Arlington statistics. Okay, and we don't right. have anything on Arlington. I, I guess we probably yeah. don't have that small. Okay, thank you. Mr. Hainer. Just for clarification, the liaison you're looking for, are you looking for a member of the committee? We're looking for an administrator or somebody that can kind of be the go-to person that we can work with. So it doesn't have to be a school committee member. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Thielman, Dr. McNeil and Dr. Janger in that order. <laughs> Only because much. that's how you are on my screen. <laughs> Go ahead, Mr. Thielman. Uh, thank you. So I thank you very much for this presentation and uh, that was a very brave of everyone to uh, share a personal story. I, um, I, I that's what I was gonna ask. Uh, Keith, you asked us to make a decision tonight on a liaison. So I didn't know if there was a nom, I don't know what we're, right, so I'm trying to figure out the next step in this process in naming the liaison. That was my question. So are we gonna get any clarity from that? Or? How about Jeff, I will email you in a week. Yeah. <laughs> how about that how, how about okay. you email me okay i think we're gonna get a i think we're gonna we might get uh, let's see what dr mcneil and dr jinger have to say because their okay. hands went up right okay. quick That's what I was looking for. What's so, next? dr mcneil go ahead uh, i just want to make sure that i'm in the proper procedure with school committee rules but i I'd, I'd be proud to be a liaison to this, uh, to your organization. So a lot of things that you are uh, pursuing, the goals that you have align with, you know, what we're trying to do within the school district, especially, and it falls in, within my responsibilities as teacher education, professional development and curriculum. So um, I'd be more than happy to partner with you and we can um, email each other, exchange our contacts, and then we can, get the ball rolling and we can have an initial meeting as soon as possible. That would be great. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Janger. You're on mute, sir. Um, so as I was saying, um, I mean, first of all, I just wanna say how proud we are of our students. M has done a great job. The GSA has done a great job. I did wanna clarify one thing um, because I want to say this to M that the students should not feel that in any way we expect them to carry the load of um, training our teachers or working with our teachers or supervising our teachers. In the conversation about pronouns, it was something I think that initially came out of um, conversations in the anti racism working group. We've done lots of training with staff, we've done lots of training where we bring in professionals. We also, though, really want the students to feel like they have a voice and that their own voices are heard, which is why, you know. Professional videos are great. I think we, um, I think we maybe use one. Was it you, Keith, or it might have been the other folks? We used one of the videos that you showed there. Um, but also, at the same time as seeing experts from outside 
seeing students in our own school is something that's really powerful and hearing their own stories. So we really wanna do both. Second piece on that is, I think in terms of thinking about liaisons, I mean, I would offer myself as a liaison at the high school, but I can think of three people at the high school who would do a better job. Um, and so I'd like to talk to all of them in terms of being a high school liaison. But I also think given the conversation that you're talking about, much of which is not just at the high school, which we'd be happy to partner with you on, I think working with Dr. McNeil as well, um, you know, because I'm, I don't think the high school GSA advisor or Mr. maybe Mr. Conklin or Ms. Rossi, but would want to be going and to the elementary principals necessarily in terms of talking about training they do at the elementary school. So maybe it would be a team, not just um, one point of contact, but might be some points of contact at different levels. But I'd be happy to speak to a few folks and give you some names from the high school as well. Thank you. I'm actually in contact with uh, David Keneally. So I, I would hope that we cannot get a teacher just because teachers are very swamped. No, I think it would be Mr. Keneally, Mr. Ms. Rossi, or Mr. Conklin, who's the history teacher, okay. history department chair, would be the three folks to talk to. And if not them, if they're all too busy, you can always call me. So I'll talk to, I'll talk to them and see how they'd like to handle it. We, we've also worked with the Massachusetts Partnership for Youth. Uh, we've, they have uh, various training modules that uh, we've brought in speakers from that organization, and they've been very effective. And so, I mean, I have a lot of ideas of things that we're doing right now. And so I just, I think it's, uh, you know, the synergy is there and, and I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Great, thank you. Anybody else, um, Ms. Exon? Um, I wanna echo the thanks um, to all of you for sharing your stories. Um, and I, as, a, as an elementary school teacher myself, um, I wanna just advocate that we support this in all of the elementary schools and not just in classrooms where a student happens to be, um, you know, genderqueer or non-binary or questioning who they are. I think these conversations need to happen in all of the classrooms um, so that all, all students and teachers um, know how to have these conversations when a student might end up in their classroom. Um, I also just wanted to ask if there's a way for your presentation, um, I know, Ms. Morgan said to send it to her to share with the school committee, but um, I think it should be added to the to the Novus agenda um, so that, that the public can also have an opportunity to see it because these these conversations are really important and I think the community needs to know that we're having them. Thanks. Great, thank you. Anybody else? Um, Mr. Schlickman? Uh, I move we uh, designate uh, Dr. McNeil as uh, the district liaison. Second. Uh, any discussion? Um, great. So, Ms. Exton, wait. I was going to discuss. Oh, so I'm, sorry. To... I'm sorry. No, please go ahead. I was just going to say thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Dr. McNeil, for offering, and it sounds like it's a really good fit. Uh, absolutely. Great. Thank sorry. you very Anything much. Else that I've that I missed. Okay, Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. And I am also yes. So thank you so much for coming this evening. Um, we, we actually have a lot of appointing authority. The school committee does. We appoint people all over town. And, and, we, and, and I remember when we appointed you, um, Mr. Missler, and, uh, and I, I, we, we tell a lot of people to come back and report to us on what they're doing. And it doesn't happen very often. And I'm particularly impressed by the three of you who came back to tell us what's going on, but also to ask things from us um, and, and get us to do things, which I'm really grateful um, that you did that this evening. And thank you for your thoughtful presentation and your very reasonable requests. And uh, we look forward to continuing to partner with you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you so much. All right, the next item on the agenda is the Arlington High School FY22 Program of Studies, second read. Um, this is something that we talked about. We did a first read two weeks ago, um, and you know, I'm happy to have discussion about this. I do wanna be clear that um, in voting to approve the Program of Studies, as we discussed yesterday in the CIAA subcommittee meeting, this is not a decision point on uh, leveling for courses for any grade for uh, the 2021-22 school year or beyond. Um, all we are doing this evening is approving 
the course, um, the course offerings um, so that it can be available to our high school administrative team to um, begin soliciting, um, uh, beginning to work with students on, on course selections. So um, Dr. Janger and Mr. McCarthy, did you guys, did you have anything that you wanted to, to share on this that hasn't, hasn't already been said? Dr. Janger? Um, not really. I think Mr. McCarthy, did you wanna to speak to the specific edits that you made in the document that you resubmitted? Um, the specific edits were um, removal of the heterogeneous courses, the ninth grade in uh, modern world history, physical science, and ninth grade English, foundations of English. Um, we are looking to have conversations about that process in the coming weeks and months uh, to discuss what that looks like. Um, what the curriculum would look like, what differentiation looks like. And um, we're really looking forward to having those conversations with the community, the students and the staff um, as we process through this conversation. Right, and then just to clarify, um, part of the, we, we got a little ahead of ourselves in trying to get the program of studies out, but there's a conversation, a short-term conversation that we plan to have in the next month in terms of looking at things that were tried this year that now folks have come back and given feedback on sort of informally. Um, a lot of questions about things like 60 versus 80 minute periods, semesterized schedules, um, the way we've used remote classes um, and heterogeneous grouping being one of those where we wanted to go through some reflection and gathering people's experiences and ideas around those. And heterogeneous grouping is one of those things. I'll be meeting with the faculty senate um, in the next few days to talk about the faculty process. We'll also have conversations with students and staff, but we do understand that in particular heterogeneous grouping, which is part of a long effort I think we've made in terms of um, increasing student participation in higher level classes um, and really increasing the equity in terms of our offerings and expectations and opportunity for all students and going more towards inclusion. So that's been a long-term effort, but this was a bit of a jump in terms of where people were with expectations. So we wanna go through both listening to folks about it, educating the community and deciding where we are on that in the next month. Um, so I look forward to that conversation and for folks out there watching, you know, look for opportunities to provide feedback. Um, we'll probably process in small groups and then put together some sort of survey to get larger impact. So that is all, thank you. So I'm looking for a motion to approve the AHS FY22 program of studies on second read. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? Uh, uh, Mr. Thielman? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna vote in, for, in favor of this. My, um, my question is just uh, our timeline for any amendment to what we're voting on tonight. So are we going to, Dr. Janger said, we're gonna have a, a, over the next month, there's going to be a research uh, conversation surveys. Are we then gonna, are you then gonna come back to us, Dr. Janger in uh, March or April and ask for an amendment to tonight's vote? I just wanna understand the time. So I guess what I would say is, I would expect to hear from me end of March, beginning of April with some presentation just on what we've learned and heard from folks and then a summative statement about what we think the fall that we are proposing to whether that means yes we really think ninth grade english should be heterogeneous and this is the process for that or whether we say um because that we don't have a we, have, we don't have a current schedule that we would use in september right we would either go back to last september's a year ago september's schedule or we would do a modification of what we're doing but none of the schedules that we currently have um are just the automatic roll forward. So I think that whole conversation to try to get a sense of the direction that we're heading so that we can start letting teachers plan um, and letting us build this, not just build the schedule, but really think through the impacts of the schedule. Because uh, as we discussed yesterday, Mr. McCarthy can make the schedule, um, you know, once we know where things are, but simply building it into the thing doesn't capture all the conversations in terms of 
how that impacts teachers' lives, how that impacts specific kids' schedules, how we then hand put through, I mean, special ed students are usually hand scheduled into those programs. Um, and so we really wanna start doing that as quickly as possible. We're already you know, a month and a half behind where we would normally be on that process. So, um, so I will give you a report at the end of March or the beginning of April. And in that report, I will either make a proposal or simply kind of inform you about the things that we are thinking we're gonna do. Thank you. Mr. Heiner. Uh, through the chair, I would like to ask Dr. Jenga to provide uh, members of the committee with just a copy of the surveys or whatever communication you are to get uh, information back from parents and students. You, Thank you. You guys want to, you want to take a cut of the editing? No. <laughs> okay. All right. Any more discussion on the program of studies? Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to reiterate just for clarification that when Mr. McCarthy said he removed the heterogeneous courses that that doesn't mean that we will not necessarily offer them. It's that we're not making that decision now. Um, it's not that they're taken totally off the plate. Anybody That's else? correct. In my understanding, that is correct. And it would be an amendment to the program of studies if we were to add them in. But we would make a proposal about that at the end of March or early April. Uh, Mr. Hainer? Uh, would that be part of the survey? Are you getting information, soliciting information from the uh, parents and students? Absolutely. I mean, either way, so there's going to be a, let's be realistic, there's going to be a short term conversation. We're going to get as much as we can and sort of figure out a direction we're going. If heterogeneous grouping is a direction we're going, I think there's probably going to be some subsequent conversations as well. But the first process on that, th these sorts of things are hard to answer a survey about if you don't have context and they're hard to trust to structure a survey about if we don't understand even how the community is framing the conversation. So the plan first is to have some small and some focus group conversations with representative groups of parents, representative groups of students, there's clearly some eighth graders who want to talk to me about heterogeneous grouping, but also really finding out like what was the experience of ninth graders? What was the experience with 10th graders? What was people's experience with semesterized classes? There's a lot of positive feedback we've gotten about a lot of these practices, but do you like remote instruction is not a good question. However, I know that there are people who've come to me and said, there's a lot of really good things we could do with remote instruction, even if we weren't in COVID anymore, in terms of increasing opportunities for kids, in terms of allowing students who are homebound or going through mental um, or medical health issues to be more engaged with school. And so listening to sort of what those things are to frame them up and then getting feedback, sort of structure questions around those is what we'll try to do. Great, anybody else? Mr. Thielman. One brief point, you know, it is, uh, I appreciate Mr. Hainer's position, but a, a subcommittee like the curriculum committee could look at a survey and give you feedback. So I, it's not out of the question. Mr. Many Mr. eyes make good surveys. So I'd be perfectly happy if, if the time allows it to give you guys as much time to look at it. You're just going to have to give me some fast turnaround. Mr. Cardin. Yeah, I just wanted to add as the committee, subcommittee chair that we're, we're always welcome to assist in any way possible. We can schedule meetings, you know, in between the regular school committee meetings. So we have more flexibility, um, you know, as you're, as you're having the focus groups and you're heading towards a certain direction, it might be good to talk to us about where you're headed before you come to us with a formal proposal in April. So um, we're, we're there to do that and, and to help you out and, and to make sure that you're hitting all the, you know, all the right points with the community discussions um, so that we don't have, you know, what we've had over the last two weeks was what looked like a proposal, what sounded like a proposal, people reacting to a proposal that wasn't a proposal. So we're, we're, we're available to help. Thanks. I appreciate that. Mr. Schlickman. Yeah, thank you very much for agreeing. Uh, you, you can't fix a survey in analysis where you don't have the proper design. And if we have a good design, good questions that capture uh, the statements that are being made by the community and weigh them, uh, and we're able to access the actual data and not just the presentation on it, uh, as, as the governing board for the district, I think we'll be able to make 
much stronger uh, and more thoughtful decisions. So thank you for uh, uh, being willing to work with us. I'm going to have to answer your question, so I might as well ask them up front, right? So that I don't, you know, and I, I've done survey design professionally and spent months on surveys and sent them out. And sometimes you get questions back and you look at them and go, that doesn't tell me anything. So um, the more eyes, the better. So absolutely. Great. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. So um, I can't remember who made the original motion nor who seconded it. Um, but I'm sure that was great. And uh, for the AHS FY22 program of studies, Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey. Yes. Mr. Steelman. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Mr. Hainer. Yes. And I am also yes. The next item on the agenda is the suspension and discipline report. Um, and I do want to note that this is something that we do do on an annual basis. Annual, um, the year, the months, and the time—it's all you know. It's it's all very amorphous right now. Um, we did do a discipline report with uh, Dr. Janger back in in June, I believe, um, or early July. Um, but um, he, he's here on our sort of more regular schedule to give us um, an update. And so take it away. So um, let me find my little thing here. So I will share my screen in one second, but I just did have a question for you because um, I mean, the data is the data from last year. That's what we usually present in December. And then we talk about trends in the middle of the year. And I'm not sure how much detail you want me to go through in terms of the um, uh, desktop too. Didn't work. Hang on. In terms of how much detail you'd like me to go into in reviewing the material that we've already talked about, would you like me to go quickly through that and then talk about current trends and activities? Um, I'd like you to mostly focus on current trends and activities. Um, well, That's going to make for a much shorter presentation, yeah, and, but a very well, positive one. Yes, and while so also keeping within our our fifteen minute presentation um, structure to the. I think I could do this in three. So. Um, so I'll be yes. fast. Go ahead. Right. So just to remind everybody of where we were, right? Um, the desk data that we talked about this summer and the data that I'm going to talk about today is our in-school suspension, out-of-school suspensions, in-school suspensions, and then detention data. Now, in-school and out-of-school suspensions are tracked very carefully and rigorously because those are reported to the state and those are a metric that we follow. Detentions has been a little bit more of a logging activity. So not every single um, student who come, is called after school who may think they have a detention is automatically there. And some things that the student may not necessarily have experienced as punitive, like a conversation with a dean, um, are, are logged also as detentions. Nonetheless, the trends that you'll see in detention data are helpful because our inconsistency in practice has been consistent across those three years. Um, and so the... Um, the other thing to note is I talked about three years because four years ago uh, or three years ago is when we first piloted collaborative problem solving. And then over the past three years, that has been something we've been phasing in training more and implementing more in our practice. So the four years ago data would be the baseline, but this only goes back to the first year. So that actually represents already a reduction. And the good news, as we talked about, is that all discipline, detentions, um, in school suspensions and out of school suspensions has consistently gone down over that three year implementation period. And as we've looked back at the data, what we find is that we are consistent in our application of data. There are issues around equity, which I'll talk about in a second, and disproportionality, but they're not disproportional in what activities get what. You know, if, it, if a student gets in a fight, they were suspended. If a student has drugs in school, they were suspended. We had a conversation about that this summer as to where we were going on those sorts of activities. But um, in some issues, disproportionality in districts, and I've seen this in the past, not in Arlington, um, came in part because students were getting different outcomes in terms of discipline for similar events. That's not the case. The disproportionality for us rose out of student behavior, which is still something we have control and responsibility for. So I'm, um, you know, just as a quick reminder of what CPS works, 
CPS, the idea is that we function from the perspective that students succeed if they can. And so we move away from the idea of discipline where you want to make students want to, which is to say, do this or else, um, or where you drop the expectation. So the idea there's plan A, do this or else, that lets people know the expectation is real. And there are some things that are still plan A. Plan C is drop the expectation, which we sometimes do for students who are not able to meet a behavioral expectation that's not super disruptive. Um, but plan B, which is to work with the student collaboratively to have a conversation that begins with empathy, really listening to and understanding the student's perspective, then raising your own concerns in non-confrontational ways that are around really problem solving, and then collaboratively problem solving to find a mutually acceptable solution. That builds relationships, it interrupts unconscious bias, um, and it develops new skills and resolves problems. That's the reason why we work on those things. So as you can see, over the last three years, we've also had a steady decline in out-of-school suspensions, going from just under 50 down to about 19. So that was about a 55% drop over that three-year period. Um, and then if you look, the proportionality in each of those has remained about the same. And this is something we still need to work on because that leads to the disproportionality by race. Um, out of school suspensions by race. So this is our student population and this is our out of school suspensions. And so if you look at the out of school suspensions over time, over the last three years, there's a lot of variability in the disproportionality because the numbers are small and one or two kids make a big difference. But if you look going back to uh, three years ago, we had 48 out of school suspensions of which 13 were African-Americans. So that was six times, but also a fairly large proportion of our African-American community, even more importantly. Um, out of school suspensions the following year um, were dropped to 30. And so now you see that it's three and a half times more likely that an African-American student will be suspended out of school. But at that point, that number has dropped down to only four students. So it's a fairly small number um, overall with a lot of, you'd have to essentially have only one case and that's true as well. And the next year we remained at four students, but the number dropped and so it was fine. Now the really important trend that we saw in that data and that I was most proud of is that if you actually looked at what these suspensions were for, what kind of behavior it was, suspensions based on conflict, um, suspensions based on, um, dropped far more than the overall suspensions and suspensions based on conflict with teachers dropped to zero. Um, and so that's a really positive outcome in terms of thinking about how we're handling behaviors because in every case where behavior had in the past four years, five years led to suspension when it was conflict with a teacher, that was always a case in which the behavior escalated. It was not a student running into the room and swearing at a teacher or running into the right. It was something that started at the level that might have been a detention or a leave my class, but then it escalated to that behavior. So the fact that the teachers have now learned to have experiences and conversations with students that de-escalate, build a relationship and resolve the problem without significant discipline is really positive. So then we'll just quickly go through there. You'll see some more trends in in-school suspensions. So that we've gone from 30 to 21, 26, that's dropped off a little bit less. One of the things we've been looking at is that in a lot of ways, the nature of our in-school suspensions have changed in that they focused a lot more on being more of an intervention. We actually use the time to get the students connected to school. And that leads us to, oh, and then detention trends, as you'll see, dropped off in a similar way. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on there. And then again, had very similar levels of disproportionality, um, a little more consistently because the numbers aren't small. So what we talked about this summer were things that we were going to do to address this. One was to really have a centralized attendance office, both because that focuses on managing that challenging behavior, but also because it will give us more consistent data, particularly around things like detentions, um, that we were gonna set metrics and really separate detentions versus things like interventions around, abs around absences or makeup work or other activities. And we were really gonna to try to target disproportionality. We've continued to work 
with Think Kids on um, those materials. So here's the funny punchline. We have had no suspensions, no in-school suspensions, and no detentions this year. Um, now, some of that, an awful lot of that, is that because we've cut the number of students present in the building by about 90%. But I do wanna be clear that that does not mean there has not been challenging behavior. We've had issues in terms of the students who are in the building. Many of those students are populations that had in the past more experience of challenging behaviors. Um, and um, we've had you know, other sorts of issues of conflict among students that happen outside of school. So one, a lot of the challenging behavior has moved in terms of our work of the deans, a lot of work around attendance and keeping students engaged. But I wanna be clear, like the, the Dean started logging for the beginning of this year, every contact and they fell off a little, it's a lot to keep track, but they were logging contacts with students. And we logged over 4,000, 4,859 contacts with students by the Deans in the first semester. We're shifting how we're, what we're gonna track in the second semester in order to, I think, get some more useful data. Of those 1,111, were flagged as being CPS. Some of those were initiating a contact saying, we have this concern, what's up with that? Some of those were spontaneous plan B where you have an interaction with the student and you say, I see this is happening, what's up with that? Um, and some of those are what we call a proactive plan B where you actually get together with teachers or a team or you sit down and you really analyze the student's behavior in order to focus and target. Those were more in the neighborhood of about 50 of those. Um, other things that we have done in terms of supporting students have been that COVID-19 mental health screen or something which we will present on at some point in the, in the future. Um, that involved screening every single student to look at stressors that they were experiencing and students who had elevated levels of stress were called by deans, counselors, or social workers. Um, and then in the small number of cases where there was really elevated concern, there was some sort of referral made, but for the vast majority of cases, it was about levels of stress. So about 30 to 35% of our students reported those elevated levels of stress, and they've been offered um, skills group and resiliency groups in terms of building coping skills and building support around navigating this pretty stressful time. Um, and then last but not least, um, we had somewhat more grandiose plans for um, continuing our work with collaborative problem solving. A lot of our PD time has been taken up with more uh, short-term issues, but we have a leadership team that continues to meet for coaching twice a month. We review plans and proposals. We talk about um, specifically a lot of the students that we're talking about so that we can make sure that we are staying at a level of intervention and skill development and not finding ourselves in the plan A position of disciplinary responses. We've had really good success with that. We offer coaching support for teachers when they report to us that they have a student um, that they're finding challenging. We'll work with them to run a plan B or to have those conversations. Um, we are uh, scheduled on March 10th to do a training to think about specific challenging behaviors related to COVID, keeping your screen on, wearing your mask, um, and then engaging with stressed students, which is something that the staff has asked for support with. Um, new teachers have done short-term review. They did not, a, mo a few of them were able to do tier one training in the summer, but most um, we were up and running. And the idea of missing three and a half days of classes during a semester when we start, didn't start teaching until uh, mid-September didn't go very well. So most of those students, those folks will get their full training this summer or next fall. Um, and we're going on with training and um, support and data analysis. So thank you very much for the time to explain all of that. The good news is no disciplinary incidents. Great, thank you. Can you um, turn off your screen sharing so that we can get everybody back on the screen? Lovely, thank you so much. Um, questions or comments from the committee? Uh, Mr. Cardin? Uh, thank you for, for that presentation and for all the work you've done on this. Uh, I just want to note that this is one of the, the issues that the Human Rights Commission had raised with us in a letter over the summer. Um, we are planning to meet with them again in March. Um, I don't know if if they'll want to talk to you about it since we don't have any we don't have any incidents this year. So um, uh, uh, you know the, the, their, their concern with the disproportionality. Um, 
you know, we're, we're making progress on that. Um, well, I, I should say, when you when re, when you're reducing the numbers of of incidents, we still have the disproportionality problem, um, but that's that's very hard to tackle unless you get you know because the numbers are so small. Um, but there's still a dispro disproportionality that that people are concerned about. Um, so it might be helpful to have uh, a more tailored presentation on just what you've been doing to address address that issue. Um, for the Human Rights Commission, if we if we are able to arrange that meeting, but I'll I'll be in touch with that. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And, and realistically, I mean, when disproportionality is three incidents, right? That can be changed literally by one or two students who come passing through town. I think the Dr. Uh, Dr. Paul Schlickman did an analysis where he sort of talked about. Uh, and often the more transient population, and this is not saying that, but often those small populations look more like the Boston area. And so it's not about, um, it's, it's just more about sort of different demographics of different groups. But realistically, and this is not an explaining it away, but realistically, we have that disproportionality in lots of our other data, right? We have that disproportionality in the representation of students in curriculum aid classes. But we have that um, as, as one of the biggest issues that impacts students' weighted GPAs. So it impacts long-term impacts. Um, so there are a lot of areas in which we really have to look at our practices to think about how we are disproportionately treating our students of color. Great, thank you. Dr. Allison Abbey. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much for this presentation, Dr. Jinger. I had a couple questions. First, uh, somewhere near the start, I think you said that the disproportion seen was from student behavior and not differential response. And I was wondering how you figured that out. So the question was, what was the incident, right? Was it a, you know, so I'm looking in, so we went through and looked, you know, was it the things for which one got suspended were fights, theft, um, drugs, I can't remember, I had the table before, but as, as those are the only things that, if you were asked one of the deans, they could probably rattle it off. Like they're the only things we suspend for, period. Um, and given that those are the only things they're suspended for, the question is to look and say, are there kids not getting suspended for those things? And is that disproportional? And we didn't see that. And the other question was, are there kids, um, getting suspended for other things, and we don't see that. And just to be clear, the numbers are small enough. Every single suspension is discussed in the leadership team. Um, the deans keep track of it somewhere else. And so every time we come in and say, okay, these two kids got into a pushing match. This kid threw a punch, this kid yelled this, a swear word, like two days, three days, like we're going back through the last 10 incidents to say like, let's make sure that these things are done in consistent ways. And then we're having the second conversation nowadays, which is, is there a more restorative, more collaborative problem solving approach that would be more effective? Um, and what we see is that, you know, for the most part, when we find that change, we don't change it for just one kid, it changes for everybody going forward. And so that stayed pretty consistent going forward. But the thing we talked about last spring, last summer, the thing that we would have tracked if we had detentions this year, um, is within detentions, there are still um, kids getting detentions for, you know, saying something disrespectful or yelling at another kids, those sorts of incidents. And it's, we don't, um, to be able to sort of look at disproportionality there is something we don't have reliable enough data on. And so it was our intent this year to code that much more consistently, but you see disproportionality in detentions. It's comparable to the disproportionality elsewhere. The thing I'm really interested in um, is having consistent data if and when we can continue with detentions next year and really monitoring whether students of color are getting detentions for the things, I think they have listed them here, right? Things that would be associated with bias, right? So discipline for behavior that's based on our attribution, 
right? You disrupted my class. You were disrespectful. Um, if that's going more disproportionately towards students of color, that's a real red, a red flag for me. But we don't have that data because we didn't track it in that way. We were starting at the higher level. We know we've cleaned it up there and we need to push down to that lower level. Okay, um, that's great. Uh, I guess the one other thing I'd be interested in is it'd just be nice to see, I like that information you had about suspension data based on conflict and that the teacher conflict has gone away. And it'd just be nice to see that in its own graph somewhere because it's something that's nice to be able to communicate well to the public because this is an area that, that has been of great concern to people. So thank you very much. Okay, anybody else? All right, thank you so much, Dr. Jinker. Um, the next item on the agenda is uh, athlete pooled testing requirement. Um, so this was, there, there are a number of items on the agenda that I expect we'll be able to move through with some um, purpose, uh, which is, is good given what we have to do. Um, but there were a number of things that had come up in the interim between meetings that um, I was made aware of. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that the committee knew about them and um, had an opportunity to ask questions if they had them. So uh, Dr. Bodhi, can you talk to us about um, pooled testing for athletes at the high school? Thank you. Um, we have decided for this upcoming season, if you recall, this year there's going to be four seasons in the athletic calendar. Um, for this season, we have made a decision to have mandatory uh, pool testing for our athletic teams. And since Dr. Janger is here this evening and we, we scheduled on the agenda so that you would be uh, adjacent to your other reports, um, it would be helpful if you could talk a little bit more about this. Um, and we, a letter has, I think it's already gone out now to the parents uh, of our student athletes. Dr. Jenger? Sure. And so, first of all, I mean, we know that in terms of the behavior that we are engaging with with students, athletics is the riskiest behavior. We think it's really important. Um, especially because of the students limited opportunities for social interaction and it's a really great protective factor for students um, but we want to be able to continue doing um, uh, athletics we've talked a lot about not seeing in school transmission um, in sport in in schools of covid but that has not been true in athletics in athletics around the county and in arlington we've had clusters of cases um, and so if we don't want to be like some districts which have had to shut down their whole athletic project program, we need to do testing and surveillance testing. And one of the challenges with athletics, and we understand the motivation, is if you do voluntary testing, the incentives for individual students are not good. The students know that if one student tests positive, their team is gonna miss 10 days. Um, and so when we did the pilot project with athletic testing and um, Cindy can talk to this more if necessary. In a lot of the sports, a lot of kids did not opt in at all. And the result of that was unfortunately not in the positive direction. Um, and I understand that because the student thinks if I opt in, we're gonna miss 10 days. But if we have clusters in the sports, we're gonna end up losing the whole season. Um, so what we want to do is make sure that the sports and the coaches and the community are kept safe. And so, we don't want athletics to be a nexus that also leads us to have to shut down other programs. So, so and, and a lot of districts, we're not the only district doing this. A lot of districts are doing this um, and it's relatively simple to do. Great, thank you, Dr. Jenger. I do wanna take a second. Um, I know I, we can do questions about this and I did also, I'm trying to be better about um, blessing and releasing our um, presenters. So uh, to Mr. McCarthy, thank you so much for being here tonight to talk to us about the program of studies. Um, and so if you want to leave us, it's, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm making it awkward for me, but I don't want it to be awkward for you. So thank you so much for coming. Um, all right, so questions from the committee for uh, Dr. Bodhi or Dr. Jinger about athletic testing. Mr. Schlickman. 
I just like to know what's going on in the rest of the league. Uh, a mix. You know, I, I know, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. I, I, we yeah. pulled informally, folks. Do you know off the top of your head? Uh, I don't. As you said, a lot of the, a lot of the communities are doing this. We had a, a survey going. Not all communities are up and running on pool testing also. Uh, so a, a number of districts would like to do it. They not, may not have the infrastructure in place quite yet to do it. Uh, not all districts in the state are doing this, are, took the state up on the offer of pool testing, which I'll talk a little bit more about on this next agenda item. So the answer is some are, some would like to, and I, I don't know about the remaining small numbers. Yeah, the question was just based on the fact that, you know, we're, we're definitely controlling for possibility of infections and spread within our teams. But obviously, when you're competing in certain sports, you're in close contact with another team. And, it, you know, it, it, it seems important to me to know if that other district has a problem as well. Dr. Chair, I'm sorry, go ahead, Dr. Bodie. I was just gonna say, it's been a universal issue throughout the league um, that there have been clusters, as Dr. Janger said, of athletes on other teams um, having COVID and then their, their team is out for a period of time. For the most part, actually, our, our athletic teams did well in that regard, if you're doing a comparison. Um, what, um, I think that your point is well taken. That's, that is one of the risks that we have with athletic programs. And we're trying to minimize as best we can within our district to make sure that our students are safe. And I think that one of the things that we will do by having some regular pool testing is that we will know uh, whether students have had exposure or not. I will also say that it's been quite a challenge for athletic directors to find out, you know, what one day and literally have to reschedule, uh, you know, different games. So it's been a challenging last season. One advantage as we are moving into the next two is that they're more outdoors. And that's going to be very helpful. Um, not that our, our winter ones were not, we had skiing, for example. Uh, so I, uh, so we're hoping that the whole league can remain pretty healthy as we go through these next two seasons. Thank you. Did you have something that I saw your hand up? Sure. I, I mean, so one of the ways to think about this is that there are three vectors by which COVID's coming onto a team. Mm -hmm. There's um, risky behavior or sort of a kid come bringing it in from outside behavior. There's a kid on the team who gets it from some other kid on the team, or there's getting it from the other teams. So we don't control, but we interact with a limited number of other teams. We don't control um, that last piece, but surveillance testing is a very strong motivator for engaging in safe behavior in the outside community. And it makes it much more likely that we're going to catch cases within the team before they spread to our own team and to other teams. And so I think it keeps us in the community safer. It keeps, um, and it, I think makes it much more likely that we don't have to shut down. There have been other, on the one hand, there's folks like Reading who are doing um, also mandatory testing. On the other hand, there are folks, I believe it was Winchester who had to shut down because they had so many cases. So, um, we don't want to be in either, you know, we, we'd, I'd rather be in the testing and have to go through a short period. Our hope was initially that we could actually test the students into the bubble, that we could try to do them before the season started so that the initial round of testing wouldn't, um, wouldn't be identifying close contacts. We could do it before the students had gotten together, but we just weren't able to do it in terms of time with the surveillance testing. But as we go into this season and then to the next season, we'll be able to do that better. Dr. Allison Ampey. Thank you. Um, a couple things. First, uh, just 
Dr. Jingri said that there were three ways that kids could get it. And I would just add a fourth, which is they just happen to get it either from a family member or someone, you know, it doesn't have to have been risky contact. It could have just been, it just happened. Um, but my question is, I'm just wondering if there's any issues in terms of mandatory testing in a school setting for students, um, whether there's any personal freedoms or anything that we're, we're breaking. Um, I'm so you can do it in athletics because that's a, 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 a Cindy or Dr. Bodie, we can do it in athletics. We cannot do it for students in general. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Anybody else on this one? Seeing none. Uh, thank you, Dr. Janger. Thank you, Mr. McCarthy. Um, all right, so the next item on the agenda is a uh, pool testing update and COVID dashboard. Um, Dr. Bodie. All right, <clears throat> thank you. Just to give a, a quick little history here um, to pool testing, which I think at this point everyone understands um, is a self-administered test short navel swab, we have a group, we keep our groups fairly small for better accuracy, good accuracy, very good accuracy. Uh, we began this program uh, back in uh, January and Cindy Sheridan Curran, who's with us this evening, and I, I believe that she is here as a, a panelist. Um, Ms. Curran, yes, okay, I thought I saw you. Um, has been the person who has been our, our coordinator of this program. And so she's here this evening to not only give us the committee update on what, what we're doing, um, but also to talk about something that we've decided this week in terms of the dashboard. As I said, we were, we were doing a pilot and about already into the pilot, that's when the, the governor uh, offered the possibility of having, uh, opting in, applying into a program where we could get six weeks of free pool testing for students and staff in our district. We applied for that program, we are in the program. And um, so now we are at the point post vacation that we are going to be having a much more extensive um, Full testing program than we did before vacation. Before vacation was really more of a pilot. And given that, uh, there's been a, a lot of requests for a dashboard. And we agree that uh, particularly now that we are going into a more uh, an extended program, that we are going to have a dashboard um, regarding the number of, regarding COVID cases in the district. Before I was just really communicating to parents uh, on a weekly or sometimes more than that basis in terms of what our cases were. So um, Ms. Curran, Sheridan Curran, you're here. Would you like to give um, some more information about where we are with pool testing? And then um, you can talk about the dashboard. Okay. Um, so this week um, we, we rolled out uh, pool testing district-wide. Um, so all of our elementary schools and um, Gibbs and the Odyssey all participated in classroom pool testing today. Um, so this is the first day that, that all of those buildings participated. Um, we have 156 pools that we registered and sent to the lab today. Um, we also tested, we also had 70 pools tested on Tuesday. Two of our elementary schools, Thompson and Bishop tested the A cohort on Tuesday. Um, as well as staff um, and staff district-wide was also tested on Tuesday. Um, of those pools, one came back positive. Um, and today we'll, we'll probably get the results from today's pool testing sometime tomorrow evening or Saturday. So we're ready to roll it out. We had a visit with um, Fox 25 News today at Thompson. Um, we did a nice story tonight on um, the Thompson efforts who, as you know, has um, piloted for us and, and really helped us develop a strategy to roll it out district-wide. So we're in really good shape in terms of um, doing this kind of large-scale testing. 
uh, we also started testing the athletes um, today for the fall two sports season. Um, and we will, we are working with Dr. Janger and the nurses at the high school to kind of figure out how to manage um, anybody who wishes to participate in student pool testing at the high school um, with the departmental shift model um, and figuring out the best way to do that as well. So we're, we're functioning at a, at a pretty high level to be able to manage every single classroom in the district um, with the exception of the high school right now and um, Monotony Preschool. Um, so we, I think we were pretty successful with that. We're learning our lessons as we go along, making it more efficient um, and spending less and less time in the classrooms. So I know our nurse at Thompson um, is able to kind of roll through that entire building in just about an hour um, and, and get, get it done and done well. Um, so that is kind of where we are. We're still kind of looking at this as a pilot period, trying to smooth over some of our um, protocols for this. Um, the nurses have been absolutely wonderful in working with us to get this done. Um, the principals have all been supportive and who have, who have assigned extra TAs to assist in the effort um, to again, make, make the um, pool testing process during the school day um, least impactful in the classroom for our students. The students are all reacting um, really well um, to self-administering. So it's been, um, I'd say, hugely successful at this point for us, knowing that so many districts are just still trying to figure out how to even begin. Um, in terms of the dashboard, we have that up. Dr. Bodie, is that live? It is, it is, I believe. Um, we can screen share. Um, Mr. Mason, Mr. Spiegel also have the link. Is that possible for you to screen share it? I'm not sure. Give me one second. Okay. And while he's doing that, I want to give um, kudos to uh, Ms. Uh, Sheridan Curran and Julie Dunn and Claudia Bertoli and uh, um, for really working on this quite a lot this week to make sure this could be um, ready to go. Once it's up, what you'll see is the um, <clears throat> month of February is broken down into weeks. So at the top of the chart, um, or the dashboard, you'll see a weekly report of cases. Um, and then in the middle of the chart, you'll see cases broken down by building um, for each month. Um, so I'm just sorry that there is an error trying to access that page currently. To the oh. Someone send me a, a different link. Um, that is the link. Is that sent? Huh. <laughs> I, I can see it on my computer, so I don't, do, should I? Can you screen share it? I'll try, oh boy. Oh, thank you. There it is. You could perhaps um, click on where it says click to expand. It might give a better shot. I think that made this, it show up this, because it was not, oh boy. Oh, okay. Yes, do you see that? So we, we do have the data each, each week and each month in terms of the breakdown between student and staff. Um, the numbers you see are by school community um, and we don't pull out and identify students and staff. It would be, I think, good data to have toward the end of the year where this data will not um, allow an opportunity to identify an individual who has been, um, who's been diagnosed with COVID. I think when we break it down to staff in a certain building, I think it's, you know, if there's one staff member in a classroom who's been quarantined, it's pretty easy to identify that person. So that's why many times when you see the principals send out their communications, they refer to it as one of our uh, community members, school community members. We do have the data and, and we'll certainly um, share that um, in a way that won't identify it and, and we won't break that down kind of publicly, um, if that makes sense. I, I, you know, we, we, we do have to um, respect people's rights to privacy and certainly, um, especially around health issues. 
So we do have that data and we will share that at the end of the year um, to break it down if anybody's wondering about that. Um, so what you see in front of you is our total case count um, through actually today. This will be updated on Fridays. Um, I did update it for the sake of, of this meeting um, to include everything up until this moment. Um, so you have the, the very latest numbers in front of you. And of course, March will break that down. You know, we'll, we'll remove the um, week ending February's from that view at the top and start with um, the first week in March. Are you ready for me to un unshare, Ms. Morgan? Please, super. Thank you for doing that. Great, all right, thank you, um, Ms. Sheridan Curran and Dr. Bodie for that update. Um, I'm really excited to see it. I think it's really important um, that we can be really transparent with our our staff and our teachers and our families. So um, questions or comments from the committee on this agenda item? All right, great. I will, I will thank, um, thank you both for uh, your commitment to continuing this, um, this testing. It's really, um, it's really important. And as somebody who um, has been testing my kids a fair amount this year, um, I'm really grateful that they can do it at school because it frees up some time for us on the weekend. So thank you. Um, all right, the next item on the agenda is the superintendent's proposed budget for FY22. I will note that this is something that we um, did look at in a fair amount of detail two weeks ago um, under Mr. Mason's guidance, um, but we wanted to make sure that all of the documentation was um, public in advance of the budget hearing. Um, so Dr. Bodhi, I'm not sure what you want to tell us um, about your about your budget, but we would love to hear it. Well, thank you very much. Um, the purpose of having this on the agenda tonight um, is that we're going to have a hearing on March 11th. And it's important, in fact, it's required that we have the entire budget detail available to the public at, at two weeks in advance. Um, I know that Mr. Mason and Dr. Um, Dr. McNeil did a great job presenting um, the budget uh, on, on February 11th. At that time, you did not have the full detail of the budget. And that's what you have tonight in Novus, is the, is the detail that you usually have um, called the budget book that's, that's there. And this, this, after this evening, this will now be posted on our website under budget. And anyone in the community can take a look at this uh, in preparation for the hearing on, again, it's March 11th, and it will be at the beginning of the school committee meeting. So that's really, it's really on the agenda today so that we can um, have a vehicle for putting this into the public domain and to make sure that people understand that, that, it, that it is there. Great, thank you very much. Questions or comments from the committee? Seeing, seeing none. Um, the next item on the agenda, thank you, Dr. Bodie. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the SLC, SLCC move to Hardy. Um, this is on the agenda because it came up um, <clears throat> as part of the budget discussion last week and Ms. Elmer was uh, was not here with us two, or sorry, two weeks ago. Um, Ms. Elmer was not here um, for that meeting. So I wanted to give her an opportunity to share with the committee what um, the plans are for that move um, because we were hearing about it as part of a, um, of a, of a budget ask, um, but I did want to just get some more information about that. So Ms. Elmer, go ahead. Sure, um, so the SLCC, um, which is our program identified for students um, with intellectual disabilities, has been housed at the Brackett Elementary School um, for several years. Um, however, since I came into the district, um, there, you know, the expanding enrollment and space constraints at Brackett, um, it has been part of a planning conversation for at least seven years about 
where that space would exist as enrollment continue to increase and more and more classrooms at bracket, um, general ed classrooms were needed at bracket. Um, so we have been looking at enrollment over the last few years and strategically looking at the enrollment um, specifically in the SLCC classrooms uh, so that we could plan a move thoughtfully. Um, if you'll recall last year, we traditionally had a K-2 class and a 3-5 class because of the demographics and the enrollment last year, it um, dropped down to one class. Um, currently have six students in grades two through four in the program. So we had one teacher um, for this current school year. That was all prior to the pandemic and shutting down. We have since had to have a remote teacher as well, but the designation for the SLC this year um, was one classroom. Um, so going into next year, we will have students who are currently at bracket will be in, they are currently in second, third, and fourth. So next year they'll be in third, fourth, and fifth. Um, that program will remain at bracket, but the K-2 classroom, which we would have to open again this year, um, and we do not have room for at bracket, or rather we have room for it this year, but then the following year we will not. So we are um, going to open it up at Hardy. There are currently no students in that program because as I just mentioned to you, we have students in um, grades two, three and four. Um, but as we have students enrolling in K, in the K2 strand, we will open that up over at um, Hardy. The three, four, three, four, five program will remain at bracket until those students age out, so to speak, until the, the grades move up as it moves to um, Gibbs. And then the three, five program will ultimately move over to Hardy as well. Great, thank you, Ms. Elmer. Questions or comments from the committee? Mr. Cardin. Uh, thank you. Um, so I, I just wanted to thank the administration for you know, thoughtfully creating this plan so that, you know, the, the fear that I expressed at the last meeting that students would have to switch schools is, is not um, not happening. Um, you know, there was a unfortunate miscommunication with that being in the budget proposal and, and being discussed here before the, the families were told about that, but that, that was um, cleared up the next day by um, the principal at Brackett and, and Dr. and, and Ms. Elmer, so. Um, the, the one follow-up question that we got that, that I think you may have seen, Ms. Elmer, was, um, you know, what happens if there is, you know, a, a, a student that transferred into the program, um, you know, for example, those third graders are in fifth grade and mm -hmm. the fourth grader comes in, where does that fourth grader go? Right. Yeah, and so based on current enrollment, that's not the case, but, you know, there could always be a move in. It's typically unlikely for that specific program that a student would, who was currently in the district would be identified at fourth grade as having intellectual disability. So, um, you know, there is the possibility that, um, that we wouldn't have previously identified, but um, that a, a student could move in. You know, I think we'll have to look at both what we have at Hardy and the age span there. So if folks understand under the regulations, you can have up to a 48 month age span within a class. So we would have to look at that. Um, you know, at, at if and when something like that happened, I think we will have to come back to the committee to make a decision about if that means additional staffing or whatnot. But based on the current enrollment of the students and what we have um, as projections, um, this. If this plan works, ideally, you know, we won't have to deal with that. Great, thank you. And then just the other comment, I, I know um, Kate Perez is, is up to the task, but um, it does does require, you know, professional development of the regular ed teachers who are going to have these SLC students in their class. And I do hope we will be providing support for that. Thank you. Great, anybody else? Good, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carter. You touched on the, the pieces that I wanted to, to talk about too. So um, the next, thank you, Ms. Elmer. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the uh, EDCO update, Dr. Bodie. Um, thank you, Ms. Martin. Well, I'm um, uh, sad to bring uh, to the school committee this evening, um, the, the vote of the board of directors of the EDCO Collaborative on, on uh, February 10th to begin termination of EDCO. 
I say it was a lot of sadness because EDCO uh, for 50 years has been a major uh, source of professional development, offering a wide range of learning opportunities for educators in our member districts, and for that matter, non-member districts. In fact, um, our district has participated in a lot of their opportunities. Um, additionally, the collaborative has provided networking and other collaboration opportunities um, for educators. In particular, it's very it's noted for its Java-like groups. And I know I've participated in them as a director of math and assistant superintendent, superintendent. And I know that many of our directors um, that, that um, in our district also participate in Java-like uh, collaborative groups. There's also been a source of um, education around professional uh, cultural competency, pr proficiency, um, anti-bias, anti-racism. It has also been offered programs for students with disabilities. And um, it's engaged students in remote education. And particularly last summer, it offered an array of courses for students. EDCO also provides special education and alternative education programs for students with disability and at-risk youth, and services paid through a variety of state and federally funded programs. Um, Arlington has has placed uh, students in these programs and, um, uh, and students have had very successful experiences in them. So I will say that the decision to terminate, to begin the process of termination was not an easy one. Um, but the situation is it, it's the financial um, hurdles that really make it, um, come to a point where there is not really a good way forward um, out of these uh, financial difficulties. Currently, um, the collaborative will be a little over a million dollars um, and have, def uh, have, will have a over a million dollar deficit for FY21, which will result in um, member districts having uh, a diff a new, another assessment this year. The process that we're in is that the board of directors, which each of the 16 members has a representative to, and I am the representative um, to the EDCO board of directors, and, and that my, my position there is uh, voted by the school committee annually. Um, the, as I said, the board of directors voted to begin the termination process, but also voted that um, the process would also have to be affirmed by member school districts. And while I did not put a vote on the agenda this evening, a vote can be taken this evening. It's important that all the member districts um, uh, make this decision by the end of March, because there are there are a number of um, things that need to be done as we move through that process. Now, the actual vote to initiate um, terminate uh, to initiate termination is is um, is to dissolve. Um, I should say it's to dissolve by June thirtieth, two thousand twenty-two. According to the articles agreement among all the 16 districts, uh, once that, once that uh, vote has taken effect and is um, and by the majority of all the districts, you still have another year before you actually dissolve. And that process involves working with the um, Department of Education, which has to approve the plan. Um, as we go through this. So there's a lot that needs to be um, initiated. And probably most importantly, uh, what would need to be initiated is um, uh, programs, special education programs, uh, what will be what we will be doing uh, going forward. 
So uh, I have given you inf financial information um, several weeks ago, and I have just received some additional updated information about our financials, which I've included this evening. And let me just tell you what the motion would be, and we can have some discussion about this. And you can, we can make the motion this evening, which by the way, four other, uh, I think no, three other school districts this week um, have already met and have, have affirmed the vote of the board of directors to begin termination. Um, but we also have the March 11th meeting, which would meet um, what is the window in which we, we, we need to make this decision. So the motion would be that the Arlington School Committee supports the termination of the EDCO Collaborative to dissolve by June 30th, 2022. I will tell you that it was a unanimous for, um, vote of the Board of Directors on February 10th. And almost to a person, they did that with um, a lot of sadness that this seems that after 50, after 50 some years in operation, that um, there's not a clear financial road forward. So I open this up if, if anybody would like to ask some questions or make some comments about this. Thank you, Dr. Bodhi. Uh, and I will note, you know, that this was something that uh, because of the, um, because of our rules around executive session, that this is something that we have met about in executive session previous um, and prior to this evening. So um, it, you know, it, it doesn't, there, there have been questions that have been asked previous as well. Um, so questions from the committee on this, uh, Mr. Thielman followed by Mr. Schlipp. Yeah, well, first of all, this is a sad day. Edco has been doing a lot of good things for our district and for the school committee, uh, school committee members for a long time. Uh, and I know that Dr. Bodhi has worked hard uh, on trying to keep, uh, being part of a group of superintendents who tried to keep the district uh, going. I don't think we have any choice but to vote for the superintendent's resolution either tonight or whenever the, the committee is ready. I would say um, what I am curious about is what's going to be the plan to wind down. I mean, they have, therapeutic, they have a therapeutic day school. They have a, you know, there's a bunch of programs that EDCO runs. Are they, are, you know, I know there's a wind down all the way to June of 22, June 30, 2022. Is there, have there been discussions about how to, you know, move these programs to other providers? Um, could you just kind of tell us a little bit about what, what, what's, what that discussion's like or been like? Uh, yes, I can to, to some extent. Um, first of all, I want to make sure that everyone understands that we have a strong commitment to all of the students in the programs. And so the programs that we have will remain operational until the end of this school year. One of the motions uh, of the board is to give the executive director, actually our interim executive director, the authority to notify uh, directors of special education uh, about the fact that the programs would likely end in June. And if there is a majority of the school, uh, school committees that also affirm this, that is the, that is the, the likely um, outcome. Since we will not ex be exactly dissolved until a year after the end of June, but we do not want to incur any costs or or perhaps even be in the building that the, the programs in Bedford um, were a number of the programs, in fact, but not all the programs are housed. We have programs in Newton and it's possible that the Newton Public Schools may um, incorporate that program. There's a program in Boston, the Boston Public Schools can decide if they want to continue the program as well and run it. So there are, are other programs, but there's a process in which you have to go through in terms of notification. And I, I, I don't think 
tonight would be the time to talk about what that would mean in terms of um, reevaluations or replacements and the process that would go through with parents of the students in those programs. But yes, there is a process. And because all of that takes time, that's why we, we felt that, was there any chance to wait until May and things could turn around? And the answer is no. We've been looking at this for all year long and decided that it's important to move forward now so that we could have a very orderly process. And there's no program that you would recommend our district to absorb? Um, the answer is no. 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 Uh, there are two programs. These are not our student special education programs, but one of them is IDEAS, and the other one is our educator license program. Talking about the educator license program, this is um, a very low cost way for teachers to um, go through a program to achieve a principal or um, administrative certification. Now, we're, we're thinking about that very carefully because we don't want that, we want the program to exist, but somewhere where the cost can be contained as we've been able to do that. We don't want it to move someplace where the costs are gonna escalate and, and, and make this a more difficult um, uh, financially for educators. Um, Ideas, which is a program that we have used a lot. In fact, um, we have, um, they've been part of our professional development days. We have people in our district who are actually presenters in ideas. Uh, that, that is something that is so essential to the work that districts are doing around anti-racism, bias, culturally proficient um, education, that that program really needs to remain. And we're working very hard to see where that program would reside. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Yep, thank you. Mr. Schlickman? Yeah, I'd like to uh, move the uh, superintendent's uh, recommended motion. And uh, upon a, a second. I'll second. Uh, you know, it, it has become obvious to us over the past uh, couple of months as the news of the financial condition of uh, this collaborative has unfolded that it is unsustainable in its uh, present form and that we really don't have any choice but to go on this path and do what is necessary in order to uh, transition the services out of the collaborative and either into a different collaborative or uh, to be hosted by uh, member districts. It's a very sad thing. Uh, there are a lot of people who work for the collaborative who uh, have dedicated themselves to children for an awful long time. And it's very disappointing that we're at this point, but the point is here, it's unmistakable. The collaborative is unsustainable and it's very sad and with regrets that I make the motion to support the superintendent's recommendation. Uh, Dr. Alice Dampy. Thank you, two things. First, I would be in favor of postponing this motion until next, until two weeks, I understand it's one that we'll take and that it will have to pass. But I'm also concerned that although we have heard of this, that it's the first time it's been discussed in the public and no one, you know, if there's anything the public wants to, wants to say to us about it, they have just heard about it today. And I would be happier giving them a little bit of time um, to get in touch. Um, the second thing is I'm going to have to turn into a driving pumpkin in a few minutes and I will be off. I mean, I'll be listening in, but I'm not going to be able to participate in discussions until I get to my destination. So, sorry. Uh, Mr. Cardin? Yeah, I, I support postponing the vote. Um, I, I, I don't know if there's a, what the parliamentary procedure is, but I think, I mean, just getting the data, you know, in, in Novus, I mean, the cost to close the EDCO could be as much as $8.6 million, right? And the question I asked at the other meeting um, 
was, is it really, is it really so outrageous to continue to operate it at a million dollar deficit a year, as opposed to incurring the cost $8.6 million right now? And I, I still don't have an adequate answer to that. I mean, I think, you know, there, there was a management failure here. Um, there, there were clearly COVID concern, uh, issues that, that tripped up the, the collaborative, but, um, you know, we had a board of directors that entered into this lease that now suddenly is so terrible. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I'm not convinced that this is the correct way to go. Uh, and I'd like more time to, to look into it. Uh, the, Madam Chair, then I'll withdraw my motion. Okay. All right, so it, uh, it'll it be, Dr. Bode, I'll get to you in just a minute. So it will be on the March 11th agenda. Um, Dr. Bode, go ahead. Sorry about um, the public hearing about this. That's also part of the process is that um, it, it has been part of the, 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 the the board of director meetings are open. The agendas are open to people. We've had a number of people participate in this. And um, it's, it has been the pandemic that has been the, the really the major precipitating event. But there have been issues um, for the last couple of years in terms of meeting uh, the uh, expenses of the collaborative in part because there's a number of reasons. One is that the EDCO is, is a professional development or profe professional development organization as well as a special education provider. And the number of students that you have in these programs um, don't unevenly have for a number of years unevenly matched the, the number of students' tuitions have matched the cost of the program. So that has been an issue only exacerbated by uh, the last year. But the other issue is that as more and more districts are bringing professional development into their own districts, um, the number of people choosing to to participate in special ed programs uh, for a fee has really gone down steadily over the last few years. The, um, the networking, the job alike is all free as part of membership. So it's been some trends over the last couple of years. I don't think it was just this year, just this year um, really made it much more difficult. So I'm, I'm fine if we want to put this off to the 11th. Um, but there, until we have a majority of the school districts, the, um, the organizational formal reach out uh, to program directors will cannot happen until that happens. So, um, but that's fine to wait. Mr. Thielman? My only question is, I, I just, I, I agree with uh, Dr. Kirstie Alice Nampi that we should you know, wait two weeks. Let's see what the, if we if what we hear from the public if we learn anything new. But if we're also going to do some due diligence on, you know, any financial uh, ramifications, we should do that between now and two weeks. Um, so that's I just want to either the budget committee or another committee needs to meet or the super or we need to direct or request um, information from the superintendent. I'm not sure, uh, but something needs to happen so we don't just ha have a conversation two weeks. Hence, without any more data. Yes, um, I, I fully support the idea of having the budget subcommittee meet, so I can, you know, t discuss now more openly um, what the numbers would be, which, by the way, keep changing and will continue to change. Um, and I can talk more about that in the budget subcommittee meeting. Okay, thank you. Okay, fair enough. Budget, budget's happy to do that. I'll talk to Dr. Bodhi about timing. Okay. Right. Right. Anybody else on this item? Uh, Mr. Schlickman. Yeah, I just want to note that there are a lot of things that have to happen from this point forward. Basically, the vote that we need to take uh, now postponed is basically issuing the death certificate, uh, so to speak. Uh, metaphorically, we, we have an unsustainable program. Now, how we deal with the issue going forward 
how we adjust the programs, how do we finance the obligations of the collaborative going forward. These are all things we're going to have to work out. And some of that working out is going to extend uh, into the next year and a half. Um, but I, there's uh, no, no matter when we vote this, this week, two weeks from now, uh, the, the bottom line is this is not a sustainable collaborative. The model worked once upon a time, but because of the geographic range of the, uh, of the collaborative, the facilities and, and the needs of districts changing, uh, it just doesn't have a, a future the way it's uh, currently comprised. Right. Anybody else? Okay. Seeing none. Um, so, uh, and Ms. Sheridan Curran, I, I didn't, I'm again trying to be better about saying goodbye to people. Thank you so much for coming for your piece. I don't know if you're staying for the next one, but if you're not, um, we really appreciate you being here. So thanks so much. Um, so the next item on the agenda is a full return uh, to school planning. Um, and uh, I know that Dr. Bodhi has um, some updates for us around this. So let's start with her. Mm -hmm. I, I do. Well, I don't think, if you live in Massachusetts, you know that there was an announcement this week by the commissioner and the governor for a full return uh, for students this school year. Uh, before actually talking a little bit more about that, I, I do want to say that uh, in response to some questions earlier this evening, the district is planning for a full return in fall. Um, that, that, in my mind, has not been in question. I will also say that, that we have been planning for a return of kindergarten. In fact, we're very close to actually, you know, you know, giving you the plans for how that was going to happen in the next few weeks. And we were also planning for a return this year for grades one and two, but after our teachers had vaccinations. Uh, whether we would have three through five later on, that, that, that was a possibility, but right, we were making these plans. So this week, the commissioner said, um, has has announced that he is making a proposal to the Board of Education this month that schools, elementary schools, return in full time in person uh, the first week of April. I understand that the Board of Education is likely going to schedule a meeting sometime mid March. Now. It, it's not just the elementary. Uh, the commissioner has said that they are also going to address possibly middle schools and even further uh, along the line, um, high schools this year. But there, at right now, that is not the focus um, of the, uh, the Department of Education. Now, even though the board will perhaps um, agree with this prospect of uh, this proposal that um, the commissioner is going to present. Um, and that was mid-March. That's not something that a school system could easily move into in a couple of weeks. So I will say this, so we've, we've already started to take a look at what is going to be necessary to do that. It's also important to understand uh, um, the role that we all play potentially in this, assuming the uh, affirmation of the Board of Education, is that this is being done under um, student learning time. And we've had some discussions this year uh, about the, the student learning time, whether it was, whether it was in-person or synchronous instruction. And what would be the proposal is that the only time other than for remote academy, and I will talk about that in a second, but for in-person learning, which would be our hybrid program going full, full, um, full time, that the only time that would count for structured learning time would be 
hours spent in person. Now, that's the underlying idea of the proposal, which is something that just like 180 days or 900 hours, 990 for secondary, is something that would be a regulation that we would have to comply with. So we have already started looking at um, what would need to be involved in this, beginning with actually looking at the capacities of all of our elementary classrooms in every school, uh, the capacity uh, for three foot distancing, which is the minimum that would be um, that we that would be approved for um, safety and health reasons. And actually, in our plan that we put forward on August 10th, we had we had talked about the 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 range of three to six feet. Now, clearly, we would like to have as much spacing as possible, but we still need to know what is the baseline. How many um, students can be at, in the, uh, each of our classrooms in the elementary? So that analysis is going on right now. Uh, we also recognize that there are a lot of issues we would have to look at, um, one of which, and it's no small issue, is lunch. Under um, the guidance from the Department of Education, uh, you can be a minimum of three foot distance in a classroom, but if you're eating lunch with a mask off or having a mask break, you need to be six feet apart. And so right now in most of our elementary schools, uh, we, we only have the number of students in a classroom that can be seated six feet apart. So most students eat lunch right now during the winter months. And, in the fall, they were eating lunch outside, but are eating in classrooms six feet apart with their masks off, obviously. So we're going to have to figure out how that would happen. We also need to make sure that, um, you know, we might have some classes where they would not fit in a given classroom. Maybe that means moving to a different space in the, in the, in the school or some other, um, other possible remedy, which we need to talk about. Another issue we have to look at are specials. So presently, um, because of the guidance from the Department of Education around music, for example, we do music for all students remotely, whether they're, whether they're um, in the hybrid program or in the remote academy. And we would have to look at um, uh, our other specials as well. So there are a lot of details that we need to look at and also staffing. Now, it's important to know that the commissioner also said the parents who have opted into a remote program, which we call Remote Academy in Arlington, those, that program will exist until the end of the school year. And as has been the case all year, movement between the hybrid program and the remote academy programs is done on a space available basis. And there have been uh, not many, just a few instances where actually a student could not go to their home school that, that came to Arlington because there was no, uh, the capacity wasn't there. So we, we have taken that, that the plan that we currently have a six foot distancing uh, for deaths uh, quite seriously. So um, I would plan, and I know there was a motion made on uh, February 11th that uh, a plan would be presented uh, or the process for the plan development uh, on March 11th. And I, and I think that I have to assume for planning purposes that this is going to be the decision of the Board of Education and plan for how um, this could be implemented on the timeline that the uh, commissioner has, has said, because uh, we have been, as a district, adhering to our, our time and learning standards. So, um, 
that's why I'm pretty sure by March 11th, uh, I'll have some of the, as you say, the big rocks in the jar thought through. There's certainly going to be a lot of details that will, will need to be made, but we can't wait on planning until that board decision is made. Now, the planning that we do will certainly not go to waste in terms of what we were already thinking about in terms of um, some, some of our earlier grades returning um, this year. So I think I've, um, I've sort of hit on the main points that um, I wanted to, to mention tonight and uh, I'll see if there's any comments or questions. Um, I expect that the plan that I would present where we are in the planning, I should uh, say, and pretty much will be uh, the key things, should be ready by March 11th. And we also have a meeting on March 25th as well, um, which would give another chance for some more updates. Uh, there is one last thing, Ms. Morgan, and that is, um, I also know anecdotally from a couple of principals that there's going to be some parents who may not want to return uh, to that and to a, a minimum of three feet. So that's something that you know we will be doing in our communication with parents. Um, again, it, it will be on space available, but I think that um, it, it may be possible and likely possible to honor um, requests where there is a, a serious concern. All right, thank you, Dr. Bodhi. Um, I wanna call on Ms. Keyes and then come to the committee. All right, uh, thanks, Ms. Morgan. Um, I usually try to come to you guys with like a very prepared, thoughtful statement, and I hope you'll give me some leeway tonight because I don't have that. Um, I pretty much haven't slept in 48 hours because this has just blown up everything. Um, this has been the hardest year any of us have ever done. Um, I've changed grades, I've changed schools, I've changed districts, I've changed curriculums, I went through that first year teaching, and this blows all of those out of the water, how, how difficult this year has been. Um, and if we thought that we could fully return to normal school safely, we would be the first ones banging down the door to make that happen. Um, because my God, that would be so much easier than what we are doing right now. The mental gymnastics that it takes to teach this year are extraordinary. Um, and I think that the, the commissioner and the secretary of education, the governor, putting this out before teachers even get their first vaccine shot especially after they first moved us down in the line. And we understood that because high-risk people should come first and we get it. But then they also took the vaccines away from the towns. So we can't even expect to like go to work and get our shot and like keep going. We have to go into the state scramble and that means we're gonna be missing work to do that. And we're already short staffed. And then say, oh, but put 25 to 30 kids back in a room anyways, it's fine. Um, I, you know, I said in our meeting today when we were ratifying the contract and people were asking about this, I feel like we're playing a game of Jenga and we just keep pulling out the supports at the bottom and piling more things on top. And we all know that eventually that tower is gonna fall, right? And I am really, really worried about our teachers right now who are now being asked to reinvent everything all over again um, and are very worried about their safety in many cases in doing that. Um, so I, I understand the state may demand something of us and, you know, we, we have to do what we can. I understand there are a lot of parents who really want their kid back in and they are comfortable with their kid being in that circumstances. And I, we have some staff who are fine with it too. We have, I, we have a lot who are not, and we have a lot of students who are not, and we're thinking about them and that they're going to lose their in-person days and have to go remote because they're not comfortable with three feet back. Um, and we're really concerned that, you know, the CDC just put out some really great comprehensive guidance and then the state comes and says, ignore it. Like that, it doesn't make any sense. So we want to go back to school full time. Like that is the goal of everybody because like we think it's good for the kids. It's going to make things easier for us. Um, as a parent pointed out earlier today, I'm glad they're recognizing that. 
but I, it really needs to be done with an eye on safety. And you know, the more advocacy we can get to get vaccines to teachers, um, I think the better we will all be. And we do appreciate that you made that motion. Was it two weeks ago, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, at some point, um, to send a letter advocating for that. But I think that that needs to be part of this conversation about bringing kids back in. Um, I, I'm worried about our staff right now. Like we are not okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Keys. Um, so I want to open it up to the committee for questions um, or um, or comments on this. I'll. Uh, I'll wait until the end for mine. Uh, Mr. Hainer, followed by Mr. Schlickman. <clears throat> Dr. Barty, I just want to make it clear. Did I misunderstand you or did, did you say that you'd have the outlines of a plan on the 11th? Uh, I would have to have uh, the outlines of the plan on the 11th. And I will tell you that um, the plan will be involving teachers. I, I understand exactly what Ms. Keyes is saying. This has been a uh, hard year on everybody. And this isn't really isn't much time to make these plans. We've been, we've been planning the kindergarten for two months. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's a lot. And, but um, the answer is, I, I don't think that I have an option to be perfectly honest. If, if, the, if the, board of, the, the Board of Education votes this, I need to be able to have a plan in ready for being in compliance with that regulation. So that's only five weeks from now. And that is not a lot of time. And there's a, a lot that we need to do. Also, teachers need to feel safe in their building. And I know that through all the work we've done this year, right now, the feedback I've had from teachers is that they do feel safe. And I think that this is really sort of rocked that a lot. And we need to make sure that, that we maintain that. Um, and one of you know, the this, this things that we have done and will continue to do to make sure that, that we continue that um, effort. But yes, uh, if I wait until the board directors I'm sorry, the Board of Education makes this decision, then I have only three weeks to plan. That's Thank the you. issue. Uh, Mr. Schlickman? Yeah, this is most disturbing. Uh, right now, we're facing government by press release, and that's what we're responding to. Nothing more than the press release. We don't know what is coming down the pike, except for the press release that was put out by the governor's office. Now, one of two things could be happening here. Best case scenario, the state is looking to be a wonderful partner with us and they will provide a thousand uh, doses of Moderna vaccine by March 15th or Pfizer by March 22nd. So our teachers can be fully vaccinated by April 25th, which would be the week after April vacation and a wonderful time to come back to school. Let's celebrate. Or the state is bullying us, demanding a full opening without vaccinating the staff. And I fear it's the bottom, particularly because the governor has not been a very uh, good administrator in terms of either getting the vaccine out or providing a mechanism for registration. He's, he has taken the vaccine away from the towns. And if we had a thousand vac uh, doses of vaccine available to the town health department, they could just set up a clinic one day Arlington High School, all the teachers blast through the way we did our uh, public safety folks. Let's look at the perspective of who we're dealing with and what's going on here. Charlie Baker and many politicians are going to war against teachers union and blaming the fact that the schools aren't reopening. It's all the teachers unions faults. Well, look, look, first of all, teachers unions, these are kindergarten teachers, not teamsters. Secondly, the decision is ours, not the union. And I think we share a concern of the union for the health and safety and welfare of the te teachers who work for us. They're, they are employees of the district, they are members of our community and we value their health 
and safety. And if the means for ensuring their safety is available to us and the state is refusing to give it to us, I think it's unconscionable that in the same uh, breath that they are coming to us and saying, forget about it, just force them to go back to work. Th this, is, this is disgraceful or wonderful, depending on what the next steps of the state are. If the state is truly looking to get schools open, send us the vaccine and we'll get it open. Six weeks after the first shot, we'll have our schools open and, and we'll celebrate this, but do it without uh, providing the safety that is available to our uh, professional staff and our other workers in our schools that's not right. And it's within their control to make this happen. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cardin. Hi, thank you. I have a motion um, that I believe is a novice that people hopefully saw. I will read it. Um, as part of the report on options and planning taking place to expand in-person instruction during the current 2020-21 school year, which is to be provided to, by the, to the school committee by March 11th, 2021, the superintendent is directed to include an option with plans to implement full in-person learning at grades K through eight with desks no less than three feet apart, including maintaining the option for full remote learning for families who want it. Do you wanna get a second or? I'll second I'll that. I'll second. <laughs> Sorry. Mr. Carter, do you want to speak to it? Yes, thank you. So I actually wrote this motion um, before uh, the, the bombshell from Commissioner Riley. Um, you know, we, we have other districts, Cambridge in particular, moving to full in-person for, for elementary schools March 1st. Um, we have the CDC guidelines, which say when we go to yellow, uh, we're currently orange, um, we should be full in-person. So. I want a plan um, put together so we can do that. Um, I know you've been working on a plan for kindergarten, um, but that, you know, for a long time, but that we haven't heard much about it. Uh, where, you know, how are we going to address lunch? How are we going to address the issues that you raised? There's, there's a lot that we should be working on so that we can have this option. I'm not saying we should elect this option. Uh, I, I do agree that we need to get a better picture on uh, when the vaccinations will begin for our staff. We need to find out if the, the, community, com the community transmission rate continues to decline or not. Um, if we don't go into yellow, then, then maybe we won't be able to implement this. Um, so that was my thinking before Commissioner Riley came out with his, um, his plan. Now we have his requirements as well. So that just makes this all the more important that, as Dr. Buddy said, that we need to get a plan in place um, to be able to do this. And that will give us the ability as a committee on March 11th or March 25th to make a decision to implement this. If we wait until March 11th to hear about all of the hurdles that the, you know, that the administration has come up with um, without a plan in place, um, that's going to be too late. So again, we, we did have Mr. Thielman's motion from, from last time. I thought it was a little bit too vague. Um, Dr. Bodhi tonight for the first time has shared where she plans to go on March 11th. I still think that doesn't quite get us where we need to be. Um, so I'm hoping that there will be support for this more specific requirement um, for a plan to, to come before us. Thank you. All right, discussion on uh, Mr. Cardin's motion. Uh, Mr. Thielman followed by Mr. Schlickman. So I'm gonna support Mr. Cardin's motion. I, uh, I appreciate his critique of my motion from two weeks ago, uh, <clears throat> take it well. Um, I would uh, say this, um, you know, the district has to do the planning that Mr. Cardin has outlined in his motion. It sounds like from what Dr. Bodie said at the beginning, the district is doing this planning. And so we have to do this planning in order to open. I will also say that we have to do the planning um, and prepare to open. Uh, and whether, and all of us, 
I, can, I would love to see teachers vaccinated first. I voted for the motion. Um, I am appalled that teachers are not high on the list to be vaccinated. It doesn't say much about the priorities of our state or our national leadership that this hasn't happened yet. So I'm not happy about the delay in uh, vaccinating our teachers. Uh, <clears throat> I will tell you um, that one, the planning has to take place. The superintendent has already said she's gonna do the planning. So I am gonna vote for Mr. Cardin's motion. It aligns with what Dr. Bode is doing uh, right as what she said she's doing. And secondly, um, there, there, we have to do the planning because there will be people in the district who will not be comfortable with their children back in the school, even when the teachers are vaccinated. So the plan needs to be seen by the public soon. The plan needs to be understood by the public. Uh, the plan needs to be digested by the public and the more detail the public can get on March 11th, the better. So I, I support the motion. I will say there was a lot of um, anxiety and opposition when this committee voted for the hybrid model back in August, there were a lot of people that pushed back uh, and told us we were making a mistake. I think the teachers and the administrators and the students and parents have done a good job. I do think uh, people will do a good job. Uh, should we be able to go back at some point later in the spring? And secondly, um, <clears throat> I want to point out, or next I want to point out that the we have been very good in this district about doing a lot of things that other districts aren't doing. We test teachers and staff. We have pool testing. Not a lot of districts have that. Um, we have a very, I think, prudent, maybe conservative approach to uh, contact tracing and then closing cohorts in schools if we have to. Dr. Bodie's shown good judgment and wisdom in those calls. That doesn't stop if we go back to school. The testing doesn't stop. The pool, te the, the pool testing doesn't stop. The uh, prudence and leadership of Dr. Bode in terms of deciding to close a cohort or a school or a group or keep them home doesn't stop. The, the protocols don't stop. It's just that we're trying to get more kids back in the school. So I look, I think the motion makes good sense. I think it's consistent with what the superintendent is doing. And uh, I think it gives more clarity and direction of the superintendent and her staff. Uh, so I'm going to vote for this. And I look forward to, the, to, to receiving the plans on March 11th. And then we have to have a really robust debate because we'll have specifics and maybe a, a timeline shortly thereafter. And that's the real debate that we're gonna have to have. Ms. Exton. So um, if, through Ms. Morgan, if does this um, plan depend on vaccines or this motion by um, Mr. Cardin is, it's irrelevant whether or not teachers are vaccinated. Mr. Cardin, do you want to address that? I mean, the motion doesn't speak to vaccinations as a as a condition. Um, I mean, yeah, no. I mean, I think the administration can put whatever conditions um, they want in the plan. Um, you know, I, I, I think then, as a committee, we we would once we get the plan, we can determine if it's sufficient or not. If it doesn't have a vaccination requirement, and we want it to have a vaccination requirement, then we can. We can do that if uh, if it has um, something that's you know let's say for example they they don't solve the lunch issue so they have half days instead of full days um, if that's not what we we want then as a committee we can say this is this isn't the right plan um, so that that discretion is there um, but I'm looking for a plan to to move towards full return. Okay, I mean I so I'll, I will support the motion. Um, with the understanding that we're just looking for more clarification about bringing K to eight students um, into the schools in person. But I share a lot of the frustration um, that some of the other, that Ms. Keyes and Mr. Slickman have um, expressed about the vaccines. It's incredibly frustrating to continually be pushed down the list and then to be left out of municipalities being offered the vaccine so that teachers can be vaccinated, you know, right where they're working. Um, and it's, it's incredibly disrespectful to teachers um, after the amount of work that they have all done this year. Mr. Schlickman. Thank you. Two weeks ago, I would have voted no on this motion. I will vote yes for it tonight because I think we need to know what the parameters are and what this will look like. Uh, Mr. Cardin mentioned uh, whether we're orange or yellow in terms of total case counts, but there is variance within the population in the town of Arlington in terms of COVID cases. 
there has not been one single new case of COVID in the 80 plus age group since uh, the 30th of January. The biggest growth in uh, COVID cases, because we have not leveled off as a town, has been in the zero through 19 age group. So I don't know what that means for us as a school district. I would love to see the health department come and talk to us like we've been asking for since December, because listening to them and talking to them and asking questions of them is very important. And to get a half an hour of them locking onto Zoom to talk to us, I think is really urgent and that needs to happen. And I hope that gets on the agenda for the next meeting before we go for further in these considerations. But uh, we do need to know what this will look like going forward in Arlington if we're forced to do it, or if we choose to do it, this plan is something we have to have as a, as a uh, is a document to work from as we're evaluating what our choices are going forward. So that's why I'm going to vote yes on Mr. Cardin's motion. All right. Anybody else? Um, Dr. Allison Ampey, followed by Mr. Hayes. Hi. Sorry. Um, I missed just a little bit when I came into the house. Um, but a few things, and I'm gonna to have to organize my thoughts. I've been driving and confused. Um, I share Ms. Key's concerns greatly um, and her frustration, which I could hear. Um, I think this is incredible and not in a good way that the commissioner feels that this is acceptable. Um, I feel the fact that we have heard nothing that the state of public health, whether on a county level, on a town level, um, is not part of this discussion is amazing to me, also not in a good way. Um, and I too am con very concerned about the dichotomy between what the CDC guidelines say and what the commissioner wants us to do. Um, I understand there's other reports and people believe these other reports and stuff and I, I have to sit down and really compare them well. Um, but the other thing that hasn't been discussed is only footnoted or, or mentioned in passing by the CDC is the arising of the COVID variant strains and the fact that they seem, okay, and, and at this point I'm going into, I've been reading primary literature because nobody's done the summary yet for me. Um, they are significantly more infectious and they are, they look like they're more infectious in kids. And so I'm not positive I would be Okay, ideally, I would be getting information from infectious disease or, or people that I trust to get to make decisions. Um, having to make decisions on my own, I'm not positive that vaccinating the teachers alone is enough to make it safe for everyone. It certainly makes it better. It makes it better definitely for the teachers, but I am still concerned about the possibility of in school transmission on a level that we have not seen yet. Um, and I realize that these are not pleasant things to talk about, they're scary. And also that they go totally against everything that parents so much want. And I, I'm i not in that, you know, my kids are older, I'm not quite there in terms of feeling like I'm just going crazy because I'm trying to do parenting and, and teaching and, and working and everything. But just because we want it so much does not mean it will be safe. Just because we want it so much does not mean it is the right thing to do. Just because the commissioner says it is what we have to do does not mean it is the right thing to do. I think we need to come up with our right thing 
I have had discussion with town council and he is happy to come. He, he wants to get more information. He is happy to come to our next meeting to just discuss what are our alternatives and what are the possible consequences of our various alternatives. Um, so I don't know if I'll, I need to make a motion for that or if I just, if we just make that happen. Um, in terms of Mr. Cardin's motion, I will support it. I agree that it would be good to have a plan. If cases do go down, that's great. You know, if we do get into yellow, that's great. We need to have a little discussion about, are we talking about, are we on yellow townwide, county school system or what? But um, I think it's fine to have a plan, but in voting yes for the plan, I wanna be clear that I am voting for a plan to be created, not a plan that I expect to be implemented unless we think it's the right thing to do. So I think it's good that we work out all the details but, and, and I understand, Dr. Buddy, that this is probably not a good way to run a school system. It's just, that's where we are in terms of having information. Um, I think that's about as much as I've got to say. So thank you. Uh, Mr. Hainer. I agree with all my colleagues. I feel their frustration. Uh, as a former teacher, I cannot imagine uh, where the teachers are right now, they've struggled, they've done a phenomenal job over this past year, and like all of us, we, we need to commend them continually. Uh, I will be voting for this uh, for the same reasons uh, uh, Dr. Allison Ampey just stated. Uh, we need a plan. We can't wait till tomorrow to start planning. We need to have it in place and be ready for whatever reason. Thank you. All right, anybody else? Mr. Cardin. Sorry, just one quick thing. Um, I was listening to the Minuteman um, school committee meeting the other night. Um, they are also they are also moving to a three foot um, separation standard, um, but they've contracted with uh, an urgent care provider to provide all of their staff with shots once they're available at a 90 minute clinic at an area air, uh, urgent care facility. So I think that's something you know, who knows if the state's going to allocate the shots to in that manner, but it, it's certainly something that we should be looking into as a, as a fallback. Thank you. Mr. Schuchman. Uh, just to go back to Mr. Cardin's comment, we don't have to contract out to somebody else. The Arlington Health Department is ready and able to do it. We've done it in our high school building. All we need are the shots. Send us the shots, we can have it done, uh, no problem. The, the allocation is the issue. Get the shots here. I'm happy to go forward in April. Okay, anybody else? Um, so, uh, I, you know, I'll, I'm gonna support Mr. Cardin's motion. Um, I think what's important right now is that, you know, this is, um, I, I do personally believe that Desi is going to make good on their promise to do this, um, and uh, I I am personally not interested in in you know uh, jeopardizing our uh, Chapter seventy money and and getting into a protracted um, situation around taking this on with the state. And I respect if my colleagues feel differently, but I really um, want to focus on a return to school that is as safe as it can be where there is as much um, engagement with our staff and our teachers as possible around how we do that in, um, in, in as safe of a way as possible. And I also think that the message to the community right now is that, you know, this has been, return to school has been an extraordinarily divisive topic for, uh, since for almost a year, actually, right? We're a couple weeks away by the time we meet next time and we hear Dr. Bodie's plans for a full return, um, we will have been out for about a year. I, I will tell you the last thing I did in person with other humans was, was our last school committee meeting it was a Thursday night um, and I went home and that was it. So, um, you know, this has been an extraordinarily divisive issue um, in this 
uh, in this country and and very much in this community uh, for for almost a year. And I think that you know with this movement forward and with this direction um, from Desi, we are in a place where uh, we can really unite. Um, as, we can unite as a community around um, a desire to have our teachers vaccinated um, because this is not a you know if they get like we can't return to school if we have to wait like that like this is what we like Desi is going to tell us that this is what we need to do we can concurrently vociferously and aggressively advocate for teacher vaccinations while also believing as i do that 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 kids very much need to come back to school we can do both things we can be an and both community where we want to come back and we want vaccinations available for our teachers. And so I think that, you know, when, when people have asked me over the last few days, you know, how do we make this happen? I mean, this is going to happen. It's, but, but we can concurrently as a community, as a school committee, we can say, we want our teachers vaccinated. We want it to be available for them. We want it to be available in Arlington, ideally, but like, you know, we're, we're like, we, we, we need this and this is really important. Um, and so I think that what, um, you know, what we're at is, is real message unity around that piece. That seems to be now something that we can and should and have a moral obligation to be united around and to advocate for. This is not you know, well, we can go back to school when teachers are vaccinated, but I want my kids to go back to school now. Like, that's not like we're not there anymore. Desi has said, this is what we need to do. We have student learning time obligations. We need our chapter 70 money, but we can also, we can also want our teachers to be vaccinated. So I support Mr. Cardin's motion. I think that it is critical that we move forward with a plan. I have confidence um, in our superintendent and her team that they are going to work to, to do that. They will work with our, our principals and our staff and our teachers. Um, and, and I hope that the community can work very hard right alongside all of us by uh, pushing very, very hard for teacher vaccinations concurrent with this plan. So, um, Mr. Thielman, do you want to add anything? Or I, you could talk about something different, I suppose. No, no, I don't want to talk about it. I just want to, you know, I just want to say one thing. So we're, we're voting in Mr. Cardin's motion. It's a case, it, it's, it's, it's very specific in terms of, uh, 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 requesting information from the superintendent for grades K through eight. But at the same time, I just want to remind everybody that the original motion we passed on February 11th was a K through 12 plan. So even though this motion is about the three, about going to three feet for K through eight and what that would look like, we're still expecting a plan on some, some report on planning discussions, options for the high school from the superintendent on March 11th. It may be it may be we're going to stay with the status quo. It may not be. I don't know what that's going to be, but we're still expecting that. I just want to remind everybody of that. That's still part of the original motion. All right. Anything else on Mr. Cardin's motion? Seeing none. Um, where's my list? Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. And I am also yes. Um, so um, Ms. Exton followed by Dr. Allison Ampey. Sorry, I just have some a few more comments about return to school that were not specifically related to the motion. So I Go. held back. <laughs> um, so I, I guess I, I want to make sure that um, I'm clear that I well, I am share the frustration about the vaccines. I, I do feel very strongly that our youngest learners K to two need to be back in school in person as soon as possible. And so I also wanna make sure that we are finding ways to support teachers in feeling safe in the classroom um, at a distance less than six feet. So if that means that we need to increase the PPP that we're offering them, if we need to increase the ventilation that they have in classrooms, um, then those are things that we need to take into account um, with regards to this plan for coming back. And, um, you know, I, I agree, unfortunately, that I think that Desi is gonna decide that, that we all need to 
to come back, that K to five needs to come back in person in April and that's gonna happen. Um, and so, you know, I wanna make sure that we are listening to the teachers in terms of what we can do to help them to feel safe, to feel supported, to give them the resources that they need to make a change from having half of a class in their classroom at a time to having a full class of students in, in their room at a time. You know, I'm thinking about specialists who are going to, you know, be exposed um, to many more students. They're teaching essentially rem completely remotely now in K to five. Um, so that's gonna be a huge transition for those teachers. Um, so I just, I, as, a, as an early childhood educator and a parent of a second grader, I see how much and know how much K to two students need to be in school full-time as soon as possible. And so I want to make sure that that happens while making sure that our teachers feel safe and supported. There was somebody after Ms. Exton. Oh, Dr. Allison Ampey, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I appreciate and support what Ms. Exton said. I had a different question, which is just, do you want me to make a separate motion to have town council come to the next meeting or is that just, can that just happen? I'm happy to make that happen, but I'm happy to be directed to do so as well. No, if, if as long as you're comfortable with it, that's all we need. Thank you. Mr. Thielman. I mean, so it's wonderful to have town council. Do we want our own council there? Yes, um, I think we need both. I think we, okay. Okay, thank you. Mr. Schlickman. I just want to reflect on one thing is that as a political organization with three, uh, over 300 other school committees out in the state, I hope we don't wallow in helplessness and we are proactive about getting vaccines for our teachers. All right, anybody else on this item? All right, seeing none. All right, uh, the next item on the agenda is the monthly financial report with which Mr. Mason has graciously provided to us, but I believe that we were planning to push the discussion about it until uh, two weeks time. So um, that's my plan. All right, um, so we'll put that on the agenda for, for March 11th. Um, Dr. Bodie, superintendent's report. Dr. Bodhi, you're yeah, really, I'm, I'm, oh, perfect. got it. All right. Um, I'm really just going to report on the high school. Um, the As you can see that the work continues, we certainly know that it's continuing outside our windows, but that's terrific. It's wonderful to see it uh, continuing to progress. Um, the our, our owner's project manager has already uh, and approved by the building committee, um, um, hiring a moving company because when the steam wing is ready next uh, winter, um, we are going to have to arrange for, uh, for moving into the building. And so a company has been hired to do that. Um, the subcommittees are continuing to work. Um, the interiors committee is going to begin, and has actually begun, some of the exciting work around um, colors and patterns in the in the in the building. So the work continues. Um, next, the the building committee meets the first week of the month, and that's going to be next Tuesday at 6 p.m. So it, it's it's going very well. The other the other um, thing that the committee is also addressing is ceremonies and there usually is some kind of a ceremony or recognition at different times of the project obviously the ones people think about are you know when you open the the wing but there's also topping off ceremonies and i i, I think i mentioned this but i'm not sure it's worth mentioning again if i did that one of the things we're doing for seniors is to have them sign um beam 
that will be in the, the building. That has already happened, but there are also um, plans going on for another ceremony uh, for the topping off that will happen in early March. I think it's actually might happen in that range around the 7th or 8th. And our communication subcommittee and um, Dr. Allison Ampi, uh, Dr. Al Zampi is on that committee and Amy Spear are working with Consigli, our contractor, and Skanska to have some kind of taping of the event uh, so that people can you know, experience that, that, experience that virtually. So it's going along quite well, um, staying on the schedule that has um, uh, been in place. And I, don't, I, I, at the moment, there's no indication that we would be off schedule. But that's my report in the high school. And I, uh, that's, I, I have no other report tonight. Thank you. <clears throat> um, the, uh, sorry, any questions for the superintendent on her report? Just, I would just add to Dr. Bode's report that if you get on the website, there's a great video great music so you can you know the, the public should go take it if they should obviously they, they can see the building when they walk by but the, the website thanks to dr allison ampi and team and others is uh is very has a lot of information for people interested in the project dr allison ampi and then mr hayner amy spear has been doing most of the work she should be getting more of the credit i'm, I'm helping but she's she's been pulling the the uh major share so well, you go know. thank her. <laughs> Mr. Hainer. I just want to acknowledge uh, the, the amount of work that the members of the, the committee and the administration. This is something that's not normally in the normal process of the job when you come on board and it's all just added time. So thank you all for all that you've done. Appreciate it. Anybody else? Great, thank you. Uh, the next item on the agenda is a discussion about uh, the use of cameras for public comment. Mr. Schlickman. Yeah, hi, thank you very much. Uh, as a temporary measure, as long as we're operating in Zoom exile and not being in our regular meeting space, I, I think that we need to make a vote uh, to cover the way we handle public participation within the emergency. Our current policy requires people who stand at a microphone or sit at the microphone in front of us at a school committee meeting to identify themselves by name and address so we know who they are. In this forum, that I think that as an additional requirement for participation in public comment, so that they, they should be having their camera on while they're working with us, I think it's very disconcerting to have people that we don't know uh, participating in our meetings without their also uh, turning on their cameras as well. So I'd like to make a motion that the Arlington School Committee policy BEDH requires speakers participating in public comment to identify themselves by name and address during meetings conducted remotely cons uh, consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020. Speakers shall also engage your video camera while participating in the meeting. Second. All right, Mr. Schlickman, would you like to speak to your motion more than you already have? No, that's about it. I think that it's just a matter of, uh, of good governance so that if people are participating in, in our meetings that they can see us, we should see them. Okay, uh, Mr. Cardin, followed by Dr. Allison Ampi and then Ms. Exton. Thanks, I, I appreciate that perspective. Um, I, I don't feel strongly either way, but I, I would just note that um, the original remote participation um, rule allows allowed us to participate in meetings remotely just by phone. And we never utilized this, but other boards in town have. And um, so I, I don't think I'm gonna support this because um, I, I don't think it's that, it's that big of a deal that people have the video off. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampi. I also, I, I appreciate the concern. I think we can be better about requiring names and addresses, um, but I will not support the motion in terms of having camera on because if people have data plans that are limited, um, camera eats up your data something awful. And uh, 
I think it's not, I don't, I think to require them to have video on is making it hard, making a barrier for their participation. I'd rather hear what they have to say. Thank you. Ms. Exton, and then Mr. Thielman, and then Mr. Schlickman. Um, I, I um, also appreciate the, the thoughts behind the motion, but similar to what um, the previous um, committee members have said, I think in terms of accessibility, um, people could call in just on a phone um, and make public comment. There are attendees in our list who are just uh, phone numbers. Uh, you could have bandwidth, which makes it difficult to have your camera on and then have yourself be heard. Um, and I also, I think a little bit about privacy issues when, when um, the public comes to a public space to make a public comment, they are coming to, to the public space, um, having their camera on, um, you know, is letting us and the entire world, because this is, or the you know community, because this is on TV, um, you know, into their into their home and that, or wherever they are, their space, um, and that not be might not be something that that they feel comfortable with, and I wouldn't want that to be a barrier for them to make a public comment. Mr. Thielman, followed by Mr. Schlickman. So um, first of all, I, I believe this is this would only be a first reading. We would have to do two readings of this, right? This is a change in policy. And the second thing is um, I concur with my colleagues. I think I, 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 would, I would support something that said, you know, um, that the school committee prefers that your video is on, but not require it because there are certain times as other speakers have said, where it's just people aren't comfortable doing it or they're not able to do it. So, I mean, I, I think it's our preference. It would be my preference but not something I would mandate or require. Uh, Mr. Schlickman. Okay, two, two comments. First of all, if somebody is participating live within our meeting in, in normal circumstance, uh, they're being broadcast by ACMI, which is recorded on the internet and available to anybody across the world who has an internet connection. Secondly, it's a three minute maximum for participation within pu uh, public comment. So we're not really eating up a lot of bandwidth. I, maybe we should uh, look upon this as a should or uh, prefers, but uh, I, I don't think that it's appropriate to come into a public meeting and make a public comment in a public meeting and be cloaked under with that with the camera off it, it, by choice if you're choosing to make a public uh comment in a public meeting to a public body i think that there's some sort of an obligation beyond be the anonymity of being behind uh, a dark screen because otherwise we don't know who people are we, we just have a name and there are people coming through here speaking to us and we have no idea who they are uh, they haven't been well identified, and I don't know that these are Arlington residents or people who have standing in the community. Or, or going further, if, uh, if I encounter them later on in real life, can I have a conversation about what they said at the meeting? Because I don't recognize them. All right. So um, I guess my suggestion would be that we, um, that we take uh, Mr. Schlickman's motion as uh, presented and vote on that. And then depending on the outcome of that vote, I do have the language that we have in the agenda. I found it on the floor as I threw the pages down as we covered each one. Uh, magnificently, I might add, it's 935. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so I suggest we vote on Mr. Schlickman's motion and then see where we're at about whether or not we might want to adjust some of the language with something um, different. So uh, is there any more discussion on Mr. Schlickman's motion? Mr. Schlickman. I will withdraw my motion uh, in anticipation of somebody else possibly making a motion that could get to four votes. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I, I have amended with the uh, 
the support and help of Ms. Fitzgerald uh, on regular intervals, uh, the public comment section of our agenda, as we have learned a lot over the last year about how we can try to move through our agenda and also um, engage with the community. So at this point, um, the, the, the second paragraph under public comment for members of the public, and just so the committee knows when people request to make public comment, Ms. Fitzgerald or myself typically send them, you know, some some piece of this so that they understand what they're what they're signing up for. Um, so for members of the public who wish to address the committee on the Zoom call, there will be 30 minutes of public comment, depending on how many people sign up. Time allotments may be reduced, but will not exceed three minutes each. If the number of people who sign up exceeds what can reasonably what can be reasonably done in 30 minutes, the number of speakers will be capped and will be invited to speak based on the timestamp of their email to Ms. Fitzgerald. We could add a sentence in there uh, and, and we can sort of wordsmith that if people would like to the effect of it is the preference of the committee that uh, people uh, are, are, are on camera for their public comment. And then it would go on to say, if you would like to sign up to speak, please email, blah, blah, blah. Uh, also, uh, one other thing is that the policy still requires stating name and address. And so the, if that expectation is put forth in the email and made an expectation when people start talking to enforce existing policy. Yep. And I'll just, you know, I, you only got a couple more times with me, guys. Um, so, uh, but I, I'm really open to reminders um, because there's a lot going on at the beginning of these meetings. So uh, if somebody would like to help me remember to request uh, that of our uh, public commentees, I am very open to that. Um, so, uh, Mr. Hainer. You're going out in a blaze of glory. I hope so. That's my plan. Um, so, uh, so is there, you know, I, I guess I would prefer that there was a motion about the language just because I think people do feel sort of strongly about this and I don't want to sort of go on my own and then, um, so is there, is there a sentence that somebody would like to propose be added that we could get to four votes on? Move that. The school committee, committee uh, respectfully requests members of the public to um, uh, be seen on camera when they speak uh, before the meeting and uh, that we adhere to public participation policy by um, requiring participants to give their name and address. Second. All right, discussion on this one. It's the best I could do. It was a valiant effort. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. Sorry, um, that makes it still sound like it's required. You know, if, if I read that, I would think if I can't do, do it, it needs to have if possible or something in there um, because otherwise you read it and you think if I can't do it, then I shouldn't talk. I mean, I... So how about it? Respectful request that Participants utilize their camera, comma, if possible. How about that? I don't know. That's the best I can do. I'm, you know, I'm trying to. You're doing a great job, Jeff. I don't think so. Anybody else <laughs> on this? Okie dokie. Uh, any more comment on this one? No. All right. Uh, motion by Mr. Thielman amended, uh, seconded by Mr. Hainer, amended by Dr. Allison Ampey, hopefully written down by the esteemed Ms. Fitzgerald on our behalf. Uh, Ms. Exton. No. Mr. Cardin. Abstain. Dr. Allison Ampey. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Mr. Hainer. Yes. And I am also yes. All right. Um, 
We should adjourn soon. This isn't going well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're getting close because I'm going to pull some stuff off the consent agenda. Or actually, I need one of you guys to. So when I do this, uh, I need uh, Mr. Cardin. Could you please pull off the minutes because they are not done? Uh, consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine. Will be enacted by one motion. There'll be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests. In which event, the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval warrant. Warrant number. I don't know the number because it's not on here. Dated 2162021, total amount 488565.73. Approval of minutes, regular school committee minutes, February 11th, 2021. Mr. Cardin? Yeah, no, you're on mute. Sorry, please, please hold the minutes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Ms. Exton. So moved. Oh, uh, yep, yep, we need that too. Uh, second. second. Do it again. You're okay. Okay. Um, yeah. So there's the. Yep. Yeah, so so moved by Ms. Exton, seconded by. Hayner. I, I don't know. Hayner, um, good great, job. Let's vote on this. This is super. Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Dr. Alice Nampy. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Mr. Hayner. Yes. I'm also yes. Okie dokie. Uh, super uh, subcommittee and liaison reports and announcements. Budget, Dr. Allison Ampey. Budget met earlier this week to discuss um, things in preparation for long range plan. We plan to meet in on March 9th, I think, um, to follow up on how the funding over the past few years has rolled from one year to the next. And you're also gonna add EDCO to that. Oh yeah, that's right. We'll add EDCO to that. We, uh, we may need, we may with EDCO, I'll talk with Dr. Buddy whether we need to meet sooner than, than March 9th. Uh, community relations, Mr. Hainer. Uh, school committee chats have been uh, varying in attendance from two to 26. The next school committee chat will be this Saturday, February 27th at 11 o'clock uh, for grade, parents from grades uh, 6 through 12, Gibbs, Audison, and the high school. You should have received uh, a notice from your school today with the link. Thank you. Uh, CIAA, Mr. Cardin. Uh, so as we discussed, we met yesterday mostly to talk about the um, high school uh, heterogeneous classes and issues. Um, we do need to schedule a meeting, uh, hopefully soon, with the Human Rights Commission representatives to follow up with the concerns they've raised uh, back over the summer. Um, and that's it. Thanks. Uh, facilities, Mr. Thielman. No report. Policy and procedure, Mr. Schlickman. Uh, no report. High School Building Committee, Mr. Thielman. We already reported. Liaison reports. Uh, Ms. Exton. Uh, so I'm the Audison liaison and I had a community member reach out to me about um, the intersection that's being discussed at Appleton and Mass Ave and then about this, um, now I'm totally blanking on it, safe, safe routes to school, safe, um, is that, that's a grant program, I guess the person would like to know who to reach out to to have um, the schools be a part of that conversation. Well, we're uh, have talk they, or talk to Dr. Bodhi. I actually happen to know a lot about it okay. because of what they do at Stratton. But Dr. Bodhi, go ahead. Okay. Um, the person who oversees safe schools is a police officer, Cor Cor Officer Corey Rico. But I'm happy to talk to you about this off camera. Okay. Thank you. Um, any other liaison reports? That was kind of a surprise. We don't usually have those, so that was exciting. Um, announcements. Future agenda items. There were a lot tonight, so I took some notes, but if you have one that you're particularly invested in and you're concerned about my note-taking ability, uh, please do reach out to me. I will let you know briefly what I got from this evening, just so we're all on the same page. So March 11th, uh, there will certainly be an agenda item around EDCO. Uh, there is interest in meeting with the health department. I do not 
control that, but we'll see what I can do. Um, and then uh, having uh, Mr. Heim and Ms. Valerio attend uh, to talk to us um, about the issues that Dr. Allison Ampey raised. And then I know actually while we're on this topic and because I got us here at 945, uh, Mr. Schuchman, I know that we were talking about the land use acknowledgement from the Human Rights Commission and I was given some direction around that from policy, it, it, but there was not a date attached. The intent I believe is to hear from them before they go to town meeting, is that correct? Uh, the intent is to coordinate with them around their uh, approach to town meeting because okay. I, what we, we don't want to get ahead of them. We want to align with where they are, but I, I'm sure we want to support what's what's moving forward. So it's sort of a more of a coordination effort uh, rather than setting okay. a time certain. Well, what I might do um, is coordinate with them uh, myself. And then instead of bringing many to our meeting and then uh, report back on the 11th about the, uh, those coordination efforts initially. And then if we need them to come to coordinate with all of us, uh, I think that would, be, that would be great. And if it seems that that needs to happen on the 11th um, or can happen on the 25th, I just wanted to make sure that I was, I was meeting my expectations from the policy. From, from what I've been reading of what's going on with the select board and uh, progress towards uh, warrant articles is that I would envision us voting at some point to support positive action on the warrant article and once enacted uh, creating a policy on our side of the street that aligns with the article adopted by the town. The town's also moving forward with a warrant article uh, pertaining to Indigenous Peoples Day. And uh, I know there was a question of that and I've talked to town council. We can list it any way we want on our calendar without any legal issues. So uh, that's another part of that package of things we can do between now and in the end of the school year uh, in anticipation of uh, good things to come. Okay. All right. Uh, we do not, as far as I need, you know, I'm looking to Mr. Spiegel need anything in executive session. Um, so I think that I would entertain a motion to adjourn. I move we adjourn. Yeah. Okay. About time. Okay. Uh, Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Dr. Al Stampy. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Mr. Hainer. Yes. I am also yes. Have a great night. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.